good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome you all to the second panel discussion which is arranged by electrical electronic and telecommunication engineering sectional committee in isl so as you already know we have completed our first panel discussion topic on reformation of electric sector in sri lanka and uh, today also we have started we have organized a very informative and useful topic for the discussion we are going to discuss about the potential of nuclear energy and its challenges and future in sri lanka so we have invited an eminent panel to discuss this topic today with us so let me first introduce and welcome our esteemed panelists to the session so in order to represent the government authority board we invited professor s r d rosa i think uh, we don't need to give much explanation and introduction to him he is a very well known and famous person among engineering students and engineering graduates so today he will join with us not as the head of physics in university of colombo but as the chairman of sri lanka atomic energy board so after completion of his uh, bachelor's in university of colombo he obtained his uh, masters in university of petersburg and he obtained his phd in nuclear physics in university of petersburg in 19 petersburg in 1987 uh, that is an indication to understand his amount of experience and knowledge in this field so he has authored many unique books which are still famous among um, students and university undergraduates and even teachers so personally i am also one of many uh, students who benefited from his books to complete a level physics paper and uh, became an engineer so it was a great opportunity and uh, privilege for us to have you today sir thank you very much and we are warmly welcome you to the session in order to represent the utility side we invited dr vijay kon banda uh, deputy general manager transmission and generation planning silon electricity board he is also carrying a vast knowledge and experience in the field of electricity generation and transmission he is having over 30 years of experience in this electrical field and he obtained his uh, phd in uh, uh, singapore and uh, he has been a resource person in various forums discussions and conferences who is uh, giving lot of uh, experience and knowledge in field of uh, nuclear engineering so it is a great honor for us to have you today sir thank you very much for accepting our invitation and you are also warmly welcome in order to uh, represent the academia side we invited dr tushara ratnayaka uh, senior lecturer in the department of electrical engineering university of morotua and she is also one of key scientists and researcher in sri lanka who is doing research in field of nuclear engineering she obtained her phd in nuclear engineering and management from university of tokyo japan and she is currently lecturing in nuclear safety and application and nuclear power engineering in university of morotua and many other higher education institute and she has published more than 20 publications in local and international conferences and forums and she is carrying a lot of knowledge and experience in this field so it is a great opportunity for us to have you today thank you very much ma'am for accepting our invitation you are also hopefully welcome to the session then in order to represent the government regulatory commission and uh, we invited mr samind jayasekara the chairman sri lanka atomic energy regulatory council he is uh, attending at law in profession and experienced legal practitioner specializing in condominium law and currently he is serving as a member of condominium law review advisory committee appointed by the minister of justice for amend the present condominium law of sri lanka and within a very short notice he accepted our invitation i really uh, uh, 
appreciate his humbleness and thank you very much sir for accepting our invitation and uh, presenting here you also will uh, warmly welcome on behalf of isl and sectional committee then uh, we have invited another key person in the industry who has immensely contributed in projects and uh, 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 nuclear energy related uh, things in sri lanka he is mr malinda ranavira a scientific officer in international cooperation division sri lanka atomic energy board and he is currently leading the project management unit which is established to study the nuclear power option in sri lanka by minister of power and energy sri lanka and he is personally supported and uh, contributed to arrange this forum as well so i really appreciate his contribution uh, uh, given for this field to find out uh, new options for the power generation so all the council members of isl and all the uh, our ceo mr neil abesekara and all the council members and all the members of electrical electronic and telecommunication engineering sectional committee and all the guest invitees participant i know that lot of non engineering professionals are today here to witness this event so i should uh, humbly welcome you all for this session um and all the online uh, audience who are joining with us today to witness this event uh, we on behalf of isl and uh, sectional committee i would like to welcome you all before i start the uh, uh, proceedings i should give some guideline how we are going to arrange this uh, discussion today each uh, panelist will do a presentation uh, to express his so ho idea experience knowledge and expertise in the field of nuclear engineering and then we will open this floor for a one hour question and answer uh, session so all the all the online users and the physical participant can interactively join with our qna session until we start the qna session i humbly request from our online users to keep your microphone mute and uh, turn off your uh, video camera and our physical audience can also present their problems and questions to the panel uh, during the uh, panel discussion so without taking much time i would like to start the proceedings so we'll uh, going to start the presentations from professor s r reed rosa thank you very much sir over to you Hey, uh, good evening uh, to you all. I think uh, I must thank uh, uh, Vanya Rachi for inviting us uh, for this discussion, panel discussion, uh, and all the IESL members and eminent uh, uh, panel <coughs> members, uh, Dr. Vijay Kondanda and then um, Tushar, Tushar, uh, no? uh, then uh, our own uh, Malinda. Uh, he is the one who is in charge of this project and. Uh, our chairman of sa uh, sri lanka atomic energy regulatory council uh, mr samin the jayasekara uh, as you all know actually we have uh, now two institutions uh, most of the people they don't know they think it's atomic energy authority but now in 2015 uh, it was divided into uh, two institutions i am the chairman of atomic energy board we are promoting and doing the uh, nuclear stuff and uh, we have a separate institution called the regulatory council uh, so he is the chairman of regulatory council now uh, i will uh, touch up on these uh, four topics uh, start with uh, why nuclear why we are thinking of nuclear power introduction of nuclear power uh, into our energy mix uh, i think there are eminent engineers here i am not a electrical engineer but i am a physics guy so uh, i think uh, engineers know better than me uh, why we want nuclear power uh, into this mix then i will talk about positives and negatives of nuclear power when you talk about anything uh, we can't only talk about positives but there are negatives as well uh, then uh, proposals and inquiries uh, so far we have received from various vendor countries uh, i will just touch upon that Uh, then uh, lastly i will uh, uh, go with this current status current status i think i am glad to inform you that 
uh, we got the uh, cabinet approval uh, officially to go for nuclear power. We got the cabinet approval yesterday. Uh, so uh, that's also good news or bad news for some. But uh, So uh, I will just touch upon that. Okay, so uh, this is actually, I coined this uh, uh, definition. It's not copied from anywhere else. Uh, most of the other things, of course, I have got it from various uh, uh, internet and web sources. So I said nuclear power transfer the partner for a lifelong marriage with renewables to give birth to a carbon-free future. So uh, I, coined this, I coined this definition, so uh, I don't know how far it is true or false. Uh, so, uh, uh, so next slide. Now, uh, uh, if we, when we talk about this nuclear power, you know, uh, people always ask, uh, is it possible to provide electricity only by renewables in Sri Lanka because uh, there are some eminent people, especially uh, those who are uh, working with solar energy, solar and wind, and those who are doing research on solar. Uh, sometimes they believe that uh, uh, we can run or we can provide electricity in Sri Lanka only with renewables. They are very firm on it. Even we had some lot of Zoom discussions and they are deadly against uh, nuclear power. Uh, of course, in a democratic country, you can always have, uh, you can protest. Uh, so uh, now I don't, maybe I don't know the answer to this, but if the answer is yes, then of course we can stop this seminar and we can go for dinner. Because uh, if you can provide electricity only by renewables uh, in Sri Lanka, I think we don't have to uh, discuss anything further. Uh, so uh, my answer is actually, as I told you, I'm a physics guy. Uh, my answer is no, because uh, we need to have a stable and uh, I mean stable and steady power sources. Of course, renewables are welcome. I think nobody is against renewables. We sh we all we should provide as much as possible solar and wind. But on top of that, uh, we need a stable power source. So uh, in that context, actually, uh, nuclear power can provide that uh, stability to the system. Uh, always, I tell actually you now. Uh, I mean, if you want to run a, a household, uh, you have to have a, a firm income. Right? That's why we are doing uh, all these provisions. Uh, of course, you can get extra incomes. That is always welcomed. But uh, all the every time we don't get extra income. So to run a family or a household, uh, we need a, a firm income. So, uh, so that is my so a lot of I mean just the example. Uh, that I always say or tell my students, uh, intermittent or extra income is always welcomed. Uh, if you get more extra income, that's much better, unless you are an employee of central bank. Uh, right? uh, of course, uh, you have to have a firm income. That's why we are doing now. That's why most of the people uh, in this economic downturn, uh, for daily workers, that's why they got into a lot of trouble. At least we got some money because we were doing a Profession. So at the end of the month, at least uh, we got some money. So therefore, in that context, actually, uh, I think uh, we have to have firm power sources. So that should be provided by coal or LNG or whatever. So uh, as we, you know, as we understand, actually, now the government has decided uh, no more coal for future. Uh, so maybe we have to turn to LNG. Of course, oil may be out because it's expensive. So in that context, actually, nuclear power can uh, provide a very important and uh, prominent role in uh, providing the stable side of the power. Uh, then uh, I uh, got this actually, uh, when we go to this uh, uh, forums, always this uh, solar uh, people, solar and wind energy people, they always show this. 100% electricity generation through renewable by 2050. So this was actually, uh, this is a World Bank and ADB funded project. Uh, and even there are some uh, people from 
CEB as well. Uh, so uh, he says actually always they uh, show this to us uh, because already in 2017, uh, this is a firm uh, proposal, 100% uh, electric generation through renewables by 2050. And uh, this was proposed in 2017. I don't know. Uh, I think uh, now this has changed. But always uh, when you uh, uh, meet this uh, uh, renewable energy people, uh, they always say, why nuclear? Because even nuclear is, is not in this list as well. Uh, but uh, uh, we have found a proposal, or we have proposed a proposal uh, by 2050, 100% uh, electricity generation. Uh, next. But in the same uh, same uh, booklet or whatever, they are talking about thermal power also. So I was surprised to uh, see this. Uh, so they say thermal power will remain prominent source of electricity to meet the growing demand uh, added after two, 2020. I think nothing has happened after 2020. Uh, so uh, uh, the heading was 100% uh, renewables, but in the same book, you can find this. So I was surprised how come you uh, write something on thermal power because this is thermal power. So for uh, thermal power, either, either you had to burn coal or LNG or uh, uh, oil. So this was uh, uh, launched in uh, August uh, 2017. But I think uh, uh, now, the, as we know, the government uh, decision is 70% uh, renewables and 30% uh, thermal. Right. So I think uh, there are engineers, they will talk about it uh, on that. Then I just uh, went and uh, had a small search, Google, top five countries using very high percentage of renewables. Uh, Albania, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Iceland, uh, Paraguay, and Norway. So uh, what they claim is uh, they have achieved uh, maybe 80%. Maybe uh, it depends on the season also, time to time. But they have, uh, they are running there or they are providing the electric electricity power, uh, basically uh, using renewables. Uh, of course, uh, most uh, most of the energy comes from either hydropower or, of course, some countries like Iceland and Norway, they have geothermal also. So geothermal is also considered as a renewable. And top of that, actually, you can see their population also very, it's not large, 2.9 million in Iceland, 364,000. So uh, if you just search in the Google, uh, this is uh, what you get. Then I asked this question uh, from the chat GPT, because now uh, you know this, uh, everybody is using this. So uh, what they, their answer is this, while these countries have demonstrated significant progress in renewable energy generation, Achieving continuous 100% renewable electricity generation remains a challenge due to factors like intermittency of renewable sources and the need for backup power generation during periods of low renewable energy availability. So this is the problem even Sri Lanka is facing. Now I think I heard in the news uh, about a one month back, few, I think we had only about 50, more than 50% from renewables. Now uh, it has dropped to 30 to 35%. So throughout the uh, year, we don't get this uh, uh, renewables. Uh, basically, we most of the time we depend on the uh, hydropower. So that is the. So then I uh, searched. This also these are all non-nuclear countries. I think Mr. Malinda will talk about nuclear power countries, but these are all uh, non-nuclear countries. Austria, even though the IAEA housed in Austria, they are not using um, nuclear. Uh, so. Uh, Oil, 35%, uh, hydropower, 24%, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can find. Uh, so I have just picked a few countries uh, where they are not using nuclear power at all. Then Australia, you can see. Uh, then, uh, of course, New Zealand. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, Norway. So uh, these are some of the Iceland. Iceland, other renewables means its major portion comes from uh, geothermal. So there are some countries actually, uh, uh, they do not have any uh, nuclear power plants. 
so always when you uh, talk with other people who are uh, opponents of uh, uh, nuclear power, what they say is uh, there are so many countries in the world uh, without nuclear, they have managed to uh, provide the uh, power consumption in that country. Then uh, uh, here, of course, uh, these all these things we have taken it from web. Actually, all these things are there. So these are positives of nuclear power. Uh, we all know that low greenhouse gas emission uh, because uh, we consider nuclear power is sort of green because uh, it won't emit uh, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide, uh, which will uh, uh, which will uh, immensely at the end of the day it will uh, go with the uh, global warming. And uh, the other positive factor is high energy density. Because nuclear fuel contain high energy density, meaning small amount of fuel can produce a large amount of electricity. That's also sometimes uh, most of the laymen, they don't know. They think nuclear power is a magic power. Actually, it's not. Nuclear power also produces heat at the end of the day. So uh, only difference is uh, because we are tapping energy from the nucleus, so when you break a nucleus, uh, of course, you can get million times more heat compared to chemical and biological reactions. So that's the that's why uh, nuclear power becomes uh, very important because uh, we don't need uh, much of much fuel every day. If you run a coal power plant, you need tons of coal every day because it's a chemical reaction. Uh, so chemical reaction, as we always uh, teach our students. Uh, when you burn uh, all chemical reactions, atoms, uh, they do not know, I mean, nothing knows, I mean, nuclei, they don't know, they are not aware of what is happening. Sometimes when I teach just A-level students, I say uh, nucleus is, I mean, atom nucleus, you have neutrons and protons, they are like uh, father and mother, then you have uh, children. So in chemical and biological reactions, only children take part in making bonds. Nothing will happen to the family father and mother remain con in contact, right? So if you break the nucleus, because the binding energy is high, so uh, when you break a nucleus, you can get uh, more energy, million times more energy uh, compared to other type of usual reactions. So uh, then these are the uh, other positive factors, reliable base load power, because once you start, uh, it will go through steadily. So uh, so it's not uh, intermittent uh, uh, part is not there. So therefore, uh, you can consider it as a reliable base load power. I think engineers will talk about it much more than me. Then we have uh, energy security because uh, using electric uh, nuclear power, we can enhance the energy security uh, by dependence on important uh, imported fossil fuels. So these are things uh, everybody knows. Then the long operation lifespan because as we know, uh, nuclear power plants, uh, their lifetimes uh, can go up to even 60, 70 years. So uh, then if you, even though uh, uh, you need a, a sort of a high, uh, sort of a, say, if you want to start a nuclear power plant, upfront costs are very high. That's also sometimes uh, uh, opponents uh, of nuclear power say this very high costly because you need the, uh, large amount of money to uh, start a nuclear power plant. But that is, uh, you have to understand that uh, nuclear, not only nuclear power plants, even other plant, power plants, there is something called levelized cost. So you have to consider the upfront cost. Even uh, lifetimes are much larger, plant factor is high. So you have to have a levelized cost. So you can't just depend on the uh, money that you spend at the front end. Next. Uh, this will give you a, a simple example of uh, one kilogram of petrol, uh, you can say about 10 to the power 7 heat, one kilogram of coal, uh, 10 to the power 7 joules of heat, uh, one kilogram of uranium gives 10 to the power 13 joules. So always that 10 to the power 6 factor is there. Uh, when you compare nuclear uh, uh, scenario and the atomic scenario, uh, simply because uh, nuclear binding energies are of the order of MeV. Whereas uh, electron binding energies of atoms are of the order of electron volts. So MeV to electron volts, you have that 10 to the power 6 difference. Uh, so uh, 
So sometimes I say, now if your father and mother has a lot of good relationships, if you break a very strong relationship, you all cry. So it's something like that. If your binding energy is high, then when you when you convert into a stable nucleus, uh, energy will be released according to e equals mc squared. So uh, compare the times of la lighting a 100 watt bulb uh, using normal one kilo. If you run down one kilogram of water uh, from 50 meter height, you can uh, power a light bulb only five seconds because we know uh, that uh, hydropower is not a reaction. It's just a converting potential energy into um, kinetic energy. If you burn one kilogram of coal, you can run a hundred watt bulb for eight hours. But if you can fission completely one kilogram of uranium, you can run that uh, bulb for three times 10 to the power four years. So that is the scale that we are comparing. So that is the most uh, prominent advantage that we have when you use uh, nuclear power. Then of course, these are the negatives. Always we have to talk about positives and negatives, pros and cons. Always we have these safety concerns, right? Nuclear accidents happened in Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, so uh, uh, people are so much worried about these things. They always fear about these uh, nuclear accidents because even media, you have even uh, uh, films uh, on these type of topics. Uh, so sometimes, of course, you get very negative uh, publicity also. For example, Fukushima uh, accident, actually nobody died due to radiation. Uh, but of course, Chernobyl was a different story. It was a severe disaster. Uh, so of course, here we are talking about the generation two type of generation two reactors. Always, you know, engineers, scientists, technologists, they learn from their mistakes. So now we are in the era of uh, generation four nuclear power plants, which safety safety has uh, gone up up to very high standards. Uh, then the other now country like Sri Lanka always uh, they talk about radioactive waste or spent fuel. I think these are the two negatives that we think of uh, when you have new when you are going to have nuclear power in Sri Lanka because always uh, uh, public will feel that. A uh, nuclear power plant is like a nuclear bomb, it can explode, but that don't, that does not happen. Even the Fukushima power plant, uh, the accident happened because of the cooling system. It's like a radiator in our vehicle. So uh, so if you can't cool it properly, uh, then of course uh, 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 these things can happen. So then the other thing is actually radioactive waste. A country like Sri Lanka, always people are asking what you will do with this uh, spent fuel. Uh, because the country, Sri Lanka, is very small, we have no place to dump this uh, spent fuel at the end of the power plant. So, uh, in my context, actually, these are the two major disadvantages that we are having. Other things, of course, sometimes people say we have no qualified staff and all these things. I, I won't buy that argument because uh, some people say, even recently I met some people, he say, may ape culture again due to nuclear power plant current pulluan. That's what they're asking. Our culture is so, I mean, so we are undermining ourselves. Actually. Now we have very good engineers, you know. We are from a level of engineers, they score the best. So we have all best engineers in, they can uh, work in any country. Of course, sometimes because they love the country, they don't go out. So we have very good doctors, we have very good scientists. So uh, I won't buy that argument uh, saying that uh, 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 we can't run a, a nuclear power plant. Anyway, if we start the power plant, uh, of course, we can have to get help from others first. So uh, uh, to me, actually, uh, uh, these are the two major negatives uh, uh, that we encounter because that we have to address, especially the public perception. Public perception is always they think of explosions, explosions, accidents, and so on. Uh, and uh, what can you do with the uh, radioactive waste. So, uh, so I will uh, touch upon that a little later. So, these are all uh, uh, things you will find in the web: uh, maintenance, uh, operational challenges. Uh, then, of course, regular. Uh, I mean, the regulations. So, I you know nuclear power plants should be regulated very strictly. I think IAEA has all set the guidelines. 
uh, now we have started uh, changing our act also. I think uh, uh, Mr. Samin, the, the Sri Lanka Atomic Energy Regulatory Council, they have started uh, changing the act because the, our current act does not provide, uh, does not support nuclear power. It's a non-power act. So if you are going for nuclear power, we had to change the act. So that process has started. The government has appointed uh, very high eminent uh, people, uh, chaired by Justice Sobita Raja Karunanayaka. And uh, I am also a member and they are also there. So they have started uh, changing our act. Uh, so hopefully by June, July, we should be able to uh, finish that part. So uh, now then I will come to uh, the proposals that we have uh, received so far. Uh, first proposal came from Russia, uh, Rosatom. Uh, it's a very uh, comprehensive and complete proposal. Uh, you know Russia is helping uh, to build uh, two nuclear power plants in Bangladesh, uh, 1,200 megawatt two uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, I think uh, the first one will be commissioned in this year, I suppose. Uh, then they are helping uh, to build up some plants uh, very close to Sri Lanka, 207 kilometers from Kalpitiya, Kudankulam. Kudankulam power plants also they are. So I think Russians also want us also into the same triangle. I always say it's like Paul Trikone, uh, we have the Bangladesh and India and Sri Lanka. So you know, when you uh, think of nuclear power, there's geopolitics also. Uh, so uh, of course, uh, we had a lot of discussions with Russian Rosatom people. We had a lot of Zoom sessions. And we have finalized the proposal. And of course, uh, if you if you go further, what they said is you have to sign the intergovernment agreement, IGA. So that also we have discussed. So uh, before we start, we have to get the clearance from the government. So we have sent it to the foreign ministry, uh, maybe six months or seven months back. But still, we didn't get an answer. Uh, so I think because of this Russian-Ukraine war and the IMF and all these things, uh, still they have not given a positive or negative word. Uh, then we have a, a complete proposal from China, uh, CNNC, I think, uh, China National Nuclear Corporation. I think about one or two months back, they visited us. Uh, they even brought a prototype of a power plant. And uh, they also have, a, they also given us a proposal. Then France, uh, also uh, EDF, Electricity de France, they also have a send a proposal. Then we have a, a unique proposal from Denmark. Uh, it's called the Seaborg proposal. Uh, Seaborg is actually, a, I think, a Nobel, Nobel laureate, uh, chemistry Nobel laureate. Uh, he was the one who invented uh, plutonium. So uh, this Denmark is actually, uh, they are building up uh, barges or floating nuclear power plants. So uh, according to their, uh, uh, their uh, the website, the first power plant uh, will be commissioned in 2027 or 2028. Uh, that they, they are going to give it to Vietnam. Uh, then the second one is uh, Indonesia. Uh, then uh, they are planning to you third one to Sri Lanka. So uh, then, of course, we have a, a proposal, a willingness, not really a complete and compact proposal. Uh, USA is called the Ultra Safe Nuclear Cooperation. Uh, they have also have so a willing willingness. And recently, even Canada, Atomic Energy uh, Canada, Canada Limited, ne? Atomic Energy Canada Limited also. So we have, uh, for the time being, we have all these uh, 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 six proposals. So what the, now here I just want to, uh, because the normally the other power plants, uh, they are the conventional type. Now even in the Rosatom or the Russian uh, situation, they have offered us either offshore or onshore, because they also have uh, small barges. Um, so uh, of course then, the other thing that we had to uh, think is uh, the price. Because whatever happens, now always the public in this country, uh, uh, whichever way they get electricity, they, they might not care. But uh, even as human beings, we want the electricity for uh, throughout the year with the affordable price. So if you start a nuclear power plant and if the 
unit cost comes about 50, 60 rupees, there's no point of uh, building that up. So, of course, the problem is when you ask for this, uh, the, the prices, nobody will give us the exact prices unless you sign the NDA or a uh, non-disclosure non agreement or a, uh, some MOU. Uh, so, the Russians also, they have offered us different types of power plants depending on our capacity or our willingness. Of course, they have offered, offered the offshore ones as well. If you go with the offshore ones, what they say is uh, they will build that their own is it's a power purchasing agreement. Uh, power purchasing agreement. So we don't have to spend any money. Uh, they will build and bring it over here. So we have to sign a MOU for 10 years or 20 years or whatever. And uh, so we, we asked the, what is the price, but still they don't say the exact price. But when you, uh, I think Malinda has already done some studies in the Kudan Kulam power plant, uh, sorry, the, the, the Bangladesh power plant, uh, when you convert that uh, to uh, Sri Lankan rupees, it's of the order of 27, 28, 30 rupees per kilowatt hour. But I don't know what will, when you transfer that into Sri Lankan context, I don't know uh, the exact price. So don't ask me about the prices. Uh, because, uh, but whatever said and done, I firmly believe whatever we do, we should be able to uh, lower the cost of unit because that's what all people expect, even ourselves. So uh, here I just want to go back to the link. I just want to uh, show this because this is a different uh, power barge. Uh, this is also, if you go for this, actually that is also power purchasing. Uh, now they are using this new, actually it's not a new technique, molten salt reactor. So uh, sometimes the advantage of this is actually they come 200 units. Can one batch can go up to 800 megawatts. So if you want to uh, have 600, you can have three units. So it uh, one batch uh, comprises of uh, four units maximum. So 200 and you can go up to 800 uh, megawatts. So uh, Actually, the Denmark, uh, there is a collaboration between uh, South Korea and recently even Singapore has joined in this business. So they, they are collaborating with each other. So uh, now, uh, next slide. This is, uh, now, you know, this uh, molten salt means, and uh, now conventional power plants, your fuel is solid. You have uranium. Uh, I mean, uranium, when you get uranium from the horse, you have uranium 238, 99.7%. We have only view small percentage of uranium 235. So all of us know uranium 238, you can't fission because it's an even number. Even numbers you can't break easily. Uh, but uh, 235, you can break. So if you 235 is, uh, you can fission. So, uh, so in power plants, actually, we say you have to enrich the uranium. Enrich means you have to increase the concentration of uranium-235 at least up to 3 to 4 percent. So, um, uh, so why sometimes when I teach these things in with the students, they ask why? Why you have 99 percent of uranium-238 on the earth? Why you have a small percentage of uranium-235? The simple reason, simple answer is uranium compared to uranium-238, 235 lifetime is uh, short. That's the reason. Even if you assume that the, when, when the Earth was formed, if you had uranium-238, 235 with equal amounts, by this time, most of the uranium-235 has decayed because its lifetime is 700 million years, whereas 238 is 4.5 billion years. So uh, that is the reason. So actually, we are lucky also. If this was the reverse, uh, maybe we won't be here today because everybody will make uh, nuclear bombs because you have 99.7 uranium-235, only a small percentage of uranium-238. Even scientists have found some billion years ago, they have found somewhere in the Republic of Congo, uh, they have found a sort of a self-sustained nuclear uh, reaction went on without any man invention, uh, man's uh, interference. That was happened because uh, uh, several billion years ago, uh, we had a lot of uranium-235 uh, on the Earth. So luckily, at the moment, we have only very small percentage. So you had to enrich. So normal uh, power plants, you had to have this solid fuel. 
Now in this uh, molten salt reactors, actually they dissolve the fuel uh, in a, a, a salt, that is a fluorine. Uh, you, uh, I mean, you come to a lithium fluoride or something like that because it's called a salt because fluorine also in the same category with chlorine. You know, sodium chloride is a salt. So uh, this is also not very new actually. If you go back to history, when USA started uh, with uh, these nuclear power plants, they started with molten salt reacted with thorium actually. That's how they started in 1950s, 60s. Uh, so uh, now, of course, even today, there's a very resurgence of thorium reactors as well. So the reason that they gave up thorium reactor was because using thorium, you can't make, you can't make weapon grade nuclear fuel. So uh, at that time, uh, the president was uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, he gave up that thorium uh, power plants and he went for uranium. Because so using uranium, in uranium, you have a lot of uranium-238. With the high energy neutrons, it will convert to plutonium. So plutonium is uh, fissionable. So you can use plutonium even to make uh, nuclear uh, uh, bombs. You know, in Japan also, the first uh, bomb was uranium. Then that was plutonium. So when you use thorium, you, you won't get that. So that's why they have banned. That's one reason they have banned. Even the scientists who worked at that time, I think Dr. Weinberg, he, he was also sacked uh, because uh, uh, because using thorium, you can't make it. Because they are at that time, it's Cold War era. So they want to have, uh, uh, they were concentrating on making weapon grade materials. So now, even today, recently now, these thorium reactors are also very becoming popular. Uh, of course, the disadvantage of thorium is thorium you can't fission this, uh, straight away. Uranium-232, sorry, thorium-232. But with a neutron source or neutrons from a uh, uranium-235 reactor, uh, uranium uh, thorium-232 uh, converts into uh, uh, thorium-233, then it goes to protactinium, and then it beta decays to uranium-233. 233 is fissionable. So the cross-section of uh, fissioning of uranium-233 is much higher compared to 235. Cross-section means, you know, when a neutron comes and uh, hit the nucleus of uranium-235, all neutrons will not fission. Some neutrons will get absorbed. So there is always a proper, I mean, the factor or pro pro percentage where you can uh, get the, where you can achieve the uh, fission reaction. So, uh, again, don't go. So uh, this, uh, this uh, proposal actually, uh, I'm just showing this because this interest to me, not for anything else. So uh, what they say is this is very highly, the the, the chances of uh, having a accident is very, very remote because it's a liquid form. So you can use the same one as the coolant. Now, normal power plants, you have to use water. Actually, you know, water can consider, it can, can be used as coolant as well as it converts into steam. So here you have no solid rods. Uh, uranium is uh, dissolved in this. Uh, 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 that's why uh, in in the uh, in the salt liquid, that's why it's called the molten salt. Dravavulununeme because fluorine, of course, you know, comes in same category uh, with the uh, chlorine. So if uh, something if the temperature goes up, what happens? There is something called the freezer plug at the bottom. So if the temperature goes up, and one other thing is, since it is a liquid, when the temperature goes up, one it expands. When it expands, also the reaction rate goes down, and uh, the 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 what you call the freezer plug melts if the temperature goes above a threshold. Then the, all the liquid will drain into drain tanks. So then the reaction becomes subcritical because you know in nuclear fission uh, you have subcritical, critical, and supercritical. Critical means just about there, you can sustain the chain reaction. So, uh, so I, I just want to show it to you because this is uh, now uh, there's again a company called Copperhagen At Atomics. Now they are using this uh, molten salt reactor with thorium. So in future, if this becomes successful, we have a lot of thorium even in Sri Lanka. Now, uh, in, in, uh, in India, they have already 
a prototype uh, thorium power plant i think uh, kalpakkam uh, which produces 40 megawatts china has taken the lead now they have got it then they are now building trying to build up thorium power plants compared to uh, uranium power plants so there are of course these advantages are there because you convert into two and the other advantage is using thorium reactors you don't get this weapon grade material at the end and the other advantage is the residuals or the spent fuel lifetimes are shorter compared to the uranium fuel cycle you know always radioactive things so what matters is not the really radioactivity property but the lifetime if the lifetimes are very short within a very short time they decay but uh, when you have this nuclear spent fuel uh, if you produce cesium all very long lived uh, radioactive uh, materials then uh, how to store them that's the major problem so in thorium power plants you won't get i'm just giving us a little bit of physics into this so uh, so now uh, i have found even this uh, copenhagen at atomics they are also now building up thorium uh, power plants what they say is by 2028 they can build the first one so there are a lot of options nowadays because every country in the world now uh, what they want is they want to uh, mix uh, renewables with the stable power source uh, because of the carbon footprint and all these things so nuclear option becomes very viable and uh, very promising so uh, now then we have these small power plants uh, what you call the smrs so at the moment there are 65 xmrs modules in the design stage uh, so again what the scientist says engineer says smrs uh, can sustain or uh, the the chances of having a accident is very very obsolete because the sizes are small the heat production is small and there are passive cooling systems and there are a lot of safety uh, factors involved safety plugs are there so uh, at the moment us uk canada they are building up a lot of uh, smrs uh, as of 2022 only china and russia have successfully built operational smrs so uh, at sri lanka also we are looking towards this this type of nuclear power plant i think we can't go for a bigger one because of your grid capacity and the stability so uh, uh, so that's uh, where we stand at the moment so uh, okay so this a little bit of now i will come to the last slide as i told you uh, we have uh, prepared a uh, cabinet paper and we, these are the one we have asked from the cabinet to provide the strategic and visionary decision of the government of sri lanka on generation of electricity from nuclear power as a policy uh, because we know that, uh, of course, the government people can say, okay, we have given the green light, but uh, we want in writing. Because uh, when you start a nuclear power business, uh, every country in the world, actually, they they always, the cabinet or the, the top person, like the president or the prime minister, declares that we are going for nuclear uh, power. So uh, in Bangladesh, uh, I think uh, Madam Sheikh Kashina did it. UAE, some um, King Jordan did it. So, uh, so that's why we want to have a clear-cut uh, policy that uh, the approval from the government. And as I told you at the beginning, luckily uh, we got the approval yesterday. So we got the approval for the other things also. Now, since we have uh, so many proposals, uh, what the government said was go for ASO EOIs. Because if you go only with Russians, of course, maybe some may not like it. So uh, to have a level same field uh, uh, position, so they have asked us to go for EOIs. Uh, so that also uh, Sabinet has approved. Actually, we have already prepared the EOI. So now since we have got the approval from the cabinet, we can go for it. Then uh, uh, the third uh, point, actually, we... Uh, Asked, asked to change our nuclear power act that also we have already started but we got the green light from the uh, government and uh, uh, in the atomic energy also we are carefully working with them because uh, they play an important role now we have finished the first milestone even last uh, uh, last january 
uh, one of our groups uh, went to Vienna to uh, draw up the integrated work plan, IWP. So because we had to go along with the other one, I mean, you know, nuclear industry is one of the most stringent uh, industry that's in the world because there are a lot of regulations you have to adhere to. So you can't uh, uh, get away with uh, international atomic energy uh, guidelines. So uh, now I think in April, uh, in June, uh, another uh, experts are coming to Sri Lanka. Uh, so uh, up to 2026, now they are pumping money because, you know, always you have nuclear lobby, solar lobby. That's that's natural. We have to accept that. So, uh, so this is the uh, current status. Uh, so now we can uh, go ahead. Uh, so I think uh, in future we have to go for nuclear, but when, what, how, we don't know yet. But uh, uh, to have a stable power source in Sri Lanka, I think uh, we have to uh, think of nuclear power. Even a copy of this cabinet paper was sent to CEB. Uh, maybe you didn't still receive that. Uh, it was sent to all the uh, relevant stakeholder institutions. So, uh, so to come to the last point, actually, uh, as nuclear physicists, actually, uh, we are not against uh, renewables. Actually, it's renewables and nuclear nuclear power plants we say complementary. You can't replace one from the other. So sometimes I say there's nothing called solar power. Solar power is also nuclear power. When I teach the students, I say solar power is also nuclear power because we get energy from our sun. It's nuclear power. Of course, it's fusion, not fission. But all the universe is energized by nuclear power. Without nuclear power, we can't survive. So whatever said and done, uh, that is the truth. So uh, to summarize everything, actually, we have started this process. Uh, so either we can go for offshore. But I mean, personally, I believe this is my personal note. It's not the uh, decision of the Atomic Energy Board. I think uh, we can go for a uh, offshore one first because maybe the public perception or the public will not try because selecting a land may be an issue because even people protested to protest uh, when you started building a coal power plant. So um, so maybe in future this uh, thorium reactors might be viable. So then uh, okay, we have the fuel here also because we don't have to get fuel from outside. So, uh, so that is also uh, uh, something very, uh, very, uh, very, very positive uh, because India has a lot of uh, uh, thorium. Uh, we also have a lot of thorium uh, because monocytes and all these uh, sands, we have thorium. Uh, so uh, uh, that's what I want to uh, tell you. So maybe later on we can have a discussion. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rosa. So now I want to invite <coughs> uh, Dr. Vijay Kohn Banda, the Deputy General Manager of the Ceylon Electricity Board, to envision his ideas with our gathering and the forum. What is Uh, good evening to everybody. And first of all, I should be uh, thankful to the Electrical Sectional Committee uh, for giving us the opportunity to share the knowledge. And also, uh, I'm thanking the Professor Rosa giving the very good informative presentation in the uh, beginning. And it carries uh, many information to us uh, as a power plant, the power planners. So there are, I mean, uh, it is uh, light in the, the future in the nuclear. So in my presentation, uh, you can see that uh, there is nothing we call, we are, I'm not discussing anything on the nuclear power generation, but uh, I will discuss about the process, how we can uh, accommodate uh, power plant into the uh, power system in Sri Lanka. So there is a process how we can get it into the uh, generation planning, and then uh, there is a process for implementation as well. So that uh, process I will briefly uh, discuss. Uh, 
and uh, this is a little bit background. So we have the the, the policy coming from the government that is actually the uh, the Ministry of Power is representing the government, and then it is uh, the, the the policy is coming from there. And then we do have the two operators, uh, the mainly the Silong Electric Board at present, and it may change uh, maybe in the time to come. And we have uh, another the government company, the Lanka Electricity Company. So that is only the distribution and the gas regulation coming from the uh, Public Utilities Commission. I think most of the information down to you. And uh, so the, the generation planning and uh, uh, all these uh, power plan addition to the Sri Lankan power systems are basically uh, getting information from the these uh, public gassets. So one is from the national energy policy. So that was initially started 2009 and then uh, reviewed in uh, 2019. And also we get uh, uh, the information from the general policy guideline on the electricity industry for public utility commission of Sri Lanka. The latest one is in issued in January 2022. And also we have our, our own the, the operating court, generation planning court under the grid code issued by transmission licensing. It is the, the duty of the transmission lines is to publish the grid code, how we can, uh, we, how the the plant can be connected to the transmission system, how it can be operated. And those are the, the basically the information what we have to uh, include into the plan. And uh, there are a lot of uh, commitments so, uh, in going with this uh, power plant. Uh, and also the policy was also based on the some of the the, the 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 decisions taken from the world as well. The one is actually the coming from the, the Paris Agreement, we call it as a COP21. And uh, we have uh, recent uh, submissions. And also uh, the other uh, the uh, the other guidelines or so the key highlights uh, coming from the uh, publishing the locally that is actually coming from the uh, national De determined contribution of Sri Lanka to UNFCC that is also very latest addition. And then the the policy once the the government uh, the ministry is uh, given so the public public utility commission of Sri Lanka. Uh, will give you the guidelines uh, how to prepare the generation plan. So the recently we can see the latest uh, published uh, generation plan based on this uh, guidelines. So so that uh, the first one is uh, to achieve seventy percent of the renewable energy in electricity generation by twenty thirty. That is actually energy share. So for an example, uh, if you expected about thirty thousand gigawatt of uh, energy uh, delivered to the deliver the generation from the system. So uh, 70% of that, that is 25,000 should be from the renewables. So then uh, to achieve the carbon uh, neutrality by 2050 uh, in electricity generation. And the last is actually, uh, Professor Rosa also highlighted that uh, in future, we don't have any coal power additions. So that is the the main, uh, uh, the, the factors uh, or the guidelines we have been issued by the Public Utility Commission that, Sri Lanka to prepare the recent generation plan. And then uh, this is the latest uh, generation expansion plan. I think it is in the public domain, so you can refer it. So that is called, uh, it's a 20 year planning horizon starting from 2023, that is the last year and up to 2042. And also this is a rolling plan. So it will be reviewed uh, once in two years. So that means uh, there's a revision which will be uh, coming in 2020 through 2044. So we are working on that one and already part of the process we have completed and it is uh, due to submit, uh, I think within this year. And uh, this is the, the policy coming from the government, the general policy guideline formulated in terms of the section 51 of Electricity Act, number 20 of 2000, uh, 2009, you can see uh, that are the dates. And these are the highlights. You can see the, the GSL has set the targets achieving. So what I explained earlier was so 70% of electricity generation in the country uh, using the renewable energy and also uh, the carbon neutral in 2050. And also the previous policy you can see in 2019, now it was uh, replaced by this one. 
and initially there's uh, the guideline repelling uh, uh, repelling the of cl close of 2019 actually the removal of uh, firm power capacity required of uh, two thirds of demand of the power and also removal of firm capacity mix uh, mix ratio defined from coal natural gas local refined oil and hydro and also third is the one third of demand of power from the NCRE. So we can see earlier up to 2019, this was the policy. Now we can see it was removed. So earlier there's a lot of room for coals and uh, the thermal technologies. Now it has come down to a very narrow band with the 30%. So the present status uh, in the Sri Lankan power system. So this is the capacity wise uh, in the year 2023. So as everybody knows that uh, we have about 900 megawatt of coal power. So that is uh, from the 4,400 uh, 4, megawatt or 4.4 gigawatt system. So that is a uh, percentage of 17.3. And oil uh, is a 23%. Uh, it's still the one-fifth of the total capacity. And major hydro, so about 1,400 megawatt. It's about 27%. And mini hydro is uh, starting from one megawatt to a few kilowatts to 10 megawatts. That is also about contributing to 8% capacity. And solar now we can see it's 18% in the capacity wise and wind 5%. And biomass and other technologies are one. So the capacity contribution is such. And then you can see the, the demand uh, in the 2023, uh, the amount of energy. Uh, wise uh, delivered to the customers or gener generation coming from the generators. So 70% capacity contributes uh, nearly 30% of the energy share. So it's uh, because the uh, farm factor is very high. It is running as a base load plant. And uh, oil, uh, that is actually will change uh, year to year depending on the, the contribution from the hydro and others, other renewables. The 23% contribute to 20% of the energy. And hydro is still there is a big share. It is about 29 and mini hydro and altogether you can see it's nearly 50% still we have renewables in the generation mix. So that is the one we need to increase to 70% by uh, 2030 with the increase of the demand. And uh, so this is uh, capacity wise, uh, uh, I mean capacity wise installed capacity uh, the plant wise, we have uh, three complexes of the hydro, so it is contributing 1,400 megawatt and nearly 2,000 from the, the thermal power plants, uh, including the 900 megawatt coal. And then you can see in the the down, so we have the renewable contribution, uh, the, the mini hydro, about 420, been 263 altogether, about uh, we have about 1,700 megawatt of. Uh, other renewables ex ex excluding the uh, major hydro. So major hydro is 1,400. This is about 1,000, nearly 3,000 megawatt out of, out of 4,400. Uh, it is still, we have the higher renewable capacities. And then the, when you are preparing the generation plan, the basically first thing is we need to see our demand. So that is basically based on certain guidelines and then the, the methodologies we prepare the demand. And you can see just to uh, show you uh, that uh, the 20 year, 25 years we prepare the, the planning horizon, uh, the, the plan is for 20 years, but demand will be forecast for, demand is forecasted for 25 years. So starting from uh, 2023, so it will be forecasted based on several factors, GDP, and then the uh, number of uh, the household population, and so many factors we have included into the, uh, the demand forecasting, and there are methodologies to do that. And you can see the important factor is uh, the peak demand. Uh, so what we expect is 3,000 megawatt in 2023, and it is dominated in the night. But when it's go to the uh, 2026, the, the day demand is higher than the, the night peak demand. So it will be yeah, the changing of uh, uh, night time, very small duration demand into the, the large uh, duration peak in the daytime. And uh, so you can see this is the, the one of the, the milestone is 2030. The plan is the 70% target is 2030. So we can see about the demand is 25,000 gigawatt hours. 
And uh, with the losses, we have to generate about 27,000 megawatt. And uh, the capacity wise, the peak demand is 4,400 uh, megawatts. So that means about uh, nearly 30,000, so uh, around 18 to 19,000, it should come from the renewables. And uh, uh, this is actually, so we can see that uh, the demand, the net losses, and I think just for completeness, it is given here. And uh, so now uh, we have actually included uh, the reason, uh, I mean, the, the demand forecast for the next planning cycle. So we are, we have seen is uh, based on the, the, I mean, country economic growth and the other factors. Now you can see that now the demand has in the, in the next planning cycle, the demand has reduced. Right, just instead of growing, now you can see initially it is about uh, uh, the energy demand. Uh, the differences are starting from 2000 to the end of the planning cycle is 2024. It is about 7,000 reduction from the previous plan. And the capacity wise, it is starting from 500, 500, 570 megawatts. And then it is about nearly one gigawatt reduction in the, uh, the demand out of nine or 10. Out nine, not 10. So you can see that uh, some the plants, what is uh, we have forecasted or what is scheduled to be uh, implemented in the, the previous plan may not be appearing in this plan. So because of the, because of the, the demand reduction. So this will be changed actually uh, with the country situation and, and other factors. So this is uh, the, what, what is the, the based on the previous factors, uh, maybe the recent economic slowdown and all the factors are taken into consideration. So because of that reason, this reduction is there. So, but uh, it depends on how the country progress and based on that one, maybe in the, the next, next cycle, in the coming cycle, this, um, this may change. And these are in the pictorial ways. And then the resource modeling, so that is where we candidates are coming. So we can see what are the candidate options. So we can see that uh, we have the candidate option as a nuclear power test, right? So all these are basically the generation planning is done uh, through uh, software tools. So all these factors and the cost figures, the sizes, these are all these characteristics of the power plant and everything has to be fed into the uh, the software and with the cost. So then there is optimization uh, we taking place uh, within the software and that will decide the least cost generation expansion plan for the, the year wise uh, for the 20 years horizon. So we can see uh, starting from the thermal power, very small engines, IC engine. So we have the coal uh, because here we don't have coal actually because uh, the coal basically we uh, sometimes run as a, not the policy scenario, but uh, without unconstrained scenario, we have just included that into uh, the candidate and then we have run the software. And uh, so, and also, so we can see that the, the renewables also given here. And other than that, when you have the lot of renewables, so we have a lot of issues in the system. So therefore, when you're adding intermissions-based resources into the system, there are op operational aspects we have to consider. So not like uh, the perm power plant, there's a conventional power plant. So when these intermittence-based renewables are running in the system, so the system stability and all the other operational matters has to be taken into consideration. So therefore, it is always, uh, there should be someone to support when uh, OR is running in the system. So therefore, there may be several, the flexible power plants, as well as the energy storage technologies, which are basically put into the uh, uh, system in order to uh, meet the the given policy targets, right? So this is basically uh, the process how we, we can uh, get the candidate uh, power plant into the generation expansion plan. So we can see that it's starting from potential and proven power generation technologies. For an example, nuclear. So what we get uh, is the information, basically we write it to the Atomic Energy Authority. So we are asking the, what are the latest technologies and the characteristics and the cost figures and all the informations basically we send to the Atomic Energy Authority. But uh, the, uh, the we don't get what, it, <laughs> what they expected, the parameters for uh, this kind of uh, power plant. Yeah, that is, that is so that is, uh, yeah, sir. Yeah, that is clear, sir, so that 
what you have seen that because without any NDA, so they don't give the parameters. So that is there. So anyway, so we have some kind of uh, uh, the typical values, all those typical values we are basically running uh, the system and then we have some scenarios we have run for the nuclear as well. So this is common for all the candidates, uh, that means all the technologies. And uh, once it is uh, it's a proven technology, so it will be going to the selection of suitable unit site because that is also very important. So even, uh, I mean, earlier days, why the nuclear is not into the generation planning expansion because our system is very, very small system. So we can see that uh, the size of a nuclear plant earlier, it is uh, very huge, maybe about 600,000 megawatt per unit. So running the, the big power plant in the system, it will be an issue for the system stability. So therefore, they definitely in the low demand years, uh, maybe in the 2000s and 2010 and etc. So we will see that even the 300 megawatt unit size in the system is a very big one. So when you are adding our the first coal power plant in the system, the the most uh, suitable size is 200 megawatt. But uh, due to the economics and other is, uh, is scales, the 300 megawatt size was selected. So, but uh, when it is running in the system, we we got several difficulties, uh, several operation leaves. Uh, you can see that when the, when the plant trips, the entire power system fails, and then there are uh, some blackouts occur due to that reason. The finally, we have got some solutions, and then we adapted some uh, the mitigatory measures when the plant is stripped. So, like that, uh, the unit size is a very the important factor when you are deciding into the generation cycle. And then the long-term generation plan in the studies, including optimization, basically a lot of uh, technical works are going on there. So before that, you need a lot of data for the simulation. And uh, the, we uh, use uh, uh, the normal uh, standard software. So in the CB, we use the uh, SDDP and also the Opgen model that is coming from the Brazil. So there are some other technologies, other, other software tools as well. And then, uh, so once we have finished, there will be a, a three consideration. The, the, sometimes the plant will go to the the base case, so that is the uh, the, the the plan that is to be implemented. And uh, some plants will be going into the consideration of the scenarios. So that is uh, the nuclear is still in this uh, second category, and third one is the the not selected in the planning cycle. So that is this may be. Uh, it is not a screening throughout the first uh, three steps. So these are some uh, pictures of uh, different technologies you can see, and uh, combined cycle power plant, coal plant, the nuclear plants, and all are basically we consider them as uh, base load power plants. And then we have IC engine. So you can see that in our uh, uh, generation expansion plan, not, uh, I mean, the, I mean, except the, the previous one. Uh, the, only the previous one, we are introducing this IC engine and the gas turbine. So it is because of the 70% renewable energy uh, policy target we are meeting. Then a lot of intermittency-based uh, uh, resources are in the system. So in that situation, you need a lot of uh, uh, flexibility in the system for operation. The, the flexibility in the same that, uh, for an example, sometimes uh, the, your, the solar plants will be ramped up and ran down due to the cloud coverage, and the wind also will vary due to the speed of the wind variation. So in that situation, there should be someone to catch those. So therefore, the, our normal ramp rate may be about uh, 7 to uh, 8 megawatt per uh, minutes, the variation, especially in the during night time. Uh, when the peak is coming. But that will change now because a lot of renewables are there. Now it is uh, throughout the day, there are a lot of ramping up and ramping down. So when more and more renewables are there, the seven becomes about now, you, the requirement becomes about uh, 25 to 30 megawatt per uh, minute. So you can say it's a lot of uh, the ramp rate requirements there, the flexibility should be there in the system in order to the operate the system is smoothly. Otherwise you will get a lot of uh, unnecessary load shedding, the power plant tripping, and so many frequency events. So a lot of things will happen. So in that situation, this IC engine and gas uh, the turbines are basically uh, the power plant with uh, high ramp rate. 
So, and the other thing is when you see the dispatch of these power plants, so those uh, dispatches are, will be in the five to 10 percent. So that is only support the renewables. So that is the additional cost that should be included then when you add in the renewables, right? So this is common all over the world. That is not for the common to Sri Lanka, uh, any power system that is there. So these are the renewable energy technologies. So then the, the what is just to give you an highlights of the, the 2023-2042 plans. So these are the policy constraint scenarios. There are four. So the 70% uh, RE uh, scenario uh, without uh, any coal. So that is the new policy. And second one is 70% RE by 2030, increase in RE shall beyond 2030. Here, the first one, we will uh, we will use the 30% the renewable energy target, remain as it is the same. But uh, the, for the planning horizon, after 2030, there is another 10% uh, additions. We are going to up to about 80%. So then the third, uh, basically, 70% uh, RE by 2030, that is uh, with the India-Sri Lanka interconnection. So that is now also... So we are discussing about the HUDC interconnection. So we have finalized the the uh, the line route, and then uh, we have done the technical studies and most of the things we have technically we have completed, and then we have to uh, go with the what are the business models, and then uh, finalize whether we are basically now the government has given green light to go ahead with the interconnection, like the HUDC interconnection. So then uh, the fourth one is 70% uh, by 2030 and nuclear, uh, the 2040, basically, that's another the scenario. And uh, policy unconstrained, you can see that uh, there you will see some coal and the renewable targets are different, 50%, 60%. And there are the, the, the scenarios with coal and without coal. And those are the, the all the, the, the scenarios we have run for. Uh, the generation planning exercise that is in the recently approved one. So this is the base case and the nuclear development scenario. And then uh, out of the uh, outcomes of the 70% RE target, you can see the increased level of VRE, the variable renewable energy integration. So it 500 megawatt annual solar PV capacity, that is it's a huge amount, the 500 megawatt per year. So if we are going, if we are going to achieve this target, seventy percent by twenty thirty, so then from twenty three onward, we have to add five hundred megawatt per year. But uh, the implementation, you can see then uh, how much we have uh, implemented the twenty twenty three, and then what is the plan for twenty twenty four? If you see that is a very low target we have completed. So therefore, uh, if we are going with the target, so this is the one. But a lot of uh, investments are there. But uh, other part uh, is uh, the Sri Lanka, the investment coming to Sri Lanka is very, very low because of the country situation. The banks are giving the premium charges and the interest rates are very high. So therefore, there are a lot of difficulties in implementing these power plants. The most of them are IPP-based power plant. And 150 megawatt annual wind capacity, that is solar, because uh, finally, you will see that a lot of solar by lot of solar is the capacity is there, but uh, energy coming from solar is very low, about 18 to 20 percent, compared to the wind that is about 36 to 40 percent. And then uh, large scale energy storage develop uh, the deployment. So that is to support actually. So when you have uh, uh, the high capacity, because uh, the solar and the wind generations are uh, normally we take uh, the the, uh, the full capacity is connected to the system and then it will be go beyond the, the demand. So there are situation it is uh, going beyond the demands. If you have a, a 3000 megawatt demand, so if you connect all the available power plants this is as a must run plants, so the it will be over 3500 megawatt. So then the balance energy should be either stored or curtailed. So that is the, the basics. If you are curtailing, then we have to pay for them. So otherwise, uh, we have the we have to install the battery, and then we have to use it in the night time yeah, as a daily, daily cycle basis. And then uh, we need to have the more flexible thermal generation. So you can see 1,130 megawatt gas turbine power plant. The most of them are running for the running to support the renewables, and 850 megawatt IC engine power plant that is also for supporting the renewables. 
and then we can see the high in initial investment cost. So that is about initially uh, the average annual generation and storage capacity investment of 1.25 US 1.25 USD billions up to 2030. So that is the storage uh, investment. And then uh, these are the outputs. So you can see uh, just to highlight the cost. So that is the, the bottom line. So you can see the base case, and then it is uh, the reference case as well as the other, the all the cases what you have done. You can see the differences. There are about thousand uh, or two thousand billion. Uh, dollar differences are there depending on the different different cases. Right, so those are there. And detailed results for 2030, so that is extract. So you can see the solar, normally the how these operations are, normally solar will operate. We have dry season, that is we are passing now, starting from January to about uh, April. We call it as a dry season, so we don't get uh, monsoon, the, and also wind is very low. And also the rainfall is very low, and but we have sun, and high wind also we have sun, and also wet. We can see only the little difference is there. Other than that, throughout the year, we will get the sun and wind. So this season uh, we will get very low. So that is uh, the uh, the monsoon is the other side. So we will get about if we are uh, getting the monsoon from. Uh, May to October is uh, the very high wind season. You can see May to August, September. We will get uh, the very good wind. So we plants are running as a base load power plant, except very intermittency due to the change in the wind. And the wet uh, that is in October to November, so that is also very low uh, compared to this. And then hydro. So you can see the rainy seasons. And now this year, this time we don't get rain and a lot of uh, Available water in the resources are basically uh, taken for power generation. I mean, based on the, the dispatch for the irrigation and the drinking water. The main purpose is that. Method. So then uh, those requirements is fulfilled to the power generation. And the, the rainy season, you can see sometimes we are achieving about 80% uh, renewables uh, from the 80% power from the, the renewables uh, during those seasons, right? And biomass, if the pool is available, you can run, but the the implementation, we, could be good. we don't have any capacity restrictions, but uh, the implementation is uh, very slow. And then rest is the thermal. So you can see based on the other available resources, the, the nowadays we are running with the very high uh, thermal power plants. And in the during the wind seasons, it will be reduced and also wet season due to the, the rainy uh, hydropower plants running. So we'll get a reduction of the thermal. So that is the mix how uh, the, the throughout the year it is happening, de depending on the, the availability of the resources. So the thermal pool supplies, uh, the other one you can see, so a lot of uh, uh, investment, so a lot of money has to be spent during this season. And this tells you the the one of the renewable energy is, uh, integrations, uh, and we can see that this is the the demand for the uh, the one week. So depending on the uh, the the weeks, uh, the days in the week. So we can see at the bottom it is uh, the coal, and then we have the natural gas, the the based on the uh, the the present plan, and the rest you can see the the solar, wind, and the other renewables. So whatever in the red color, that is actually in the Sunday, you can see in the wet, uh, the, the Sunday you get uh, a lot of additional amount of capacity. So that is uh, normally we have uh, our spillage. So what we have to do is either we have to install, we have to store this capacity for the usage in the other time, or else we have to curtail this. So that is the, the options available. So we can see uh, the when you in the uh, the the calls uh, three calls are running, so it is very uh, very rare that uh, we will get a chance of having uh, another base load power plant. And the other problem is this: uh, the three call units are those are not the daily cycle base. You can run, you can't uh, stop. The daily cycle is not possible uh, with the uh, the present uh, power plant. So therefore, in the time to come, definitely uh, when all these are coming. So what they have to do is sometimes uh, you can see when the 
uh, the solar is not there in the night, but uh, the wind will be there, especially in the very early morning. So during that time, uh, sometimes uh, because of the, the flexibility of the coal power, the, the inflexibility of the coal power plant, sometimes you have to curtail the renewables. So that either we have to retrofit the coal power plant to, to create the flexibility, or there should be some other mechanism to uh, mitigate that. So we can see this is uh, uh, the another scenario. So we can see we are running with the only very uh, only one plant, it's coal power plant. And in the natural gas, you can see the, how it is cycling. So there are a lot of daily cycles are there uh, in the week. So especially uh, you will get a lot of renewable spillage, uh, especially uh, in the daytime because of the solar additions, right? Because there are a lot of solar capacity and uh, the demand is low. And uh, you can see this uh, spillage definitely we have to store or else uh, we have to uh, curtail. So both will incur the cost. And uh, this is a, uh, another scenario. So you can see it's a similar to that one. So when you are going with the high renewables uh, with the 70%, uh, the room for a, uh, the, the base load power plant is, I mean, restricted. So that is there. So therefore, I think it may be there because with the technology of the nuclear power generation, so what we have seen is now the unit size is coming down to a very, uh, maybe about 200 to 300 megawatt range, even 150 megawatt range. And then I have seen that even in the Bangladesh power plant, 1,200, even the capacity is very high. They, they, they are basically the demand is about uh, uh, 15 gigawatts, that's 15,000 megawatts. Even the 1,200 megawatt is a big size for them. But uh, they told that uh, this unit is uh, the flexible to operate at 40%. So that uh, out of 1,200, it will be uh, uh, come down to about 500 megawatts. So that is there. So if that flexibility is there, so that means uh, uh, compared to our coal plants, so the coal plant, it can go maybe about from three to three, 300 megawatt up to 200 megawatt. So that uh, beyond so 200 megawatt, you can't reduce the load. So that is there. So if you have a lot of flexibilities, then definitely, so you can have, a, even with the daily cycle uh, mode, we can see that the plant can start to maybe within a certain period of time and then come into the line. And uh, the, with those uh, the flexibilities, you can see that uh, it will have a room in the system. So this is the nuclear power scenario what we have, because now it's not in the base case, but it will be in the, it will be basically we have uh, considered as the second option, that is the, the scenario option. So you can see in the long-term generation expansion plan, uh, well, you can see it is uh, once in every two years we have reviewed. And 2011-2025 plant, uh, we don't have any scenario. And then uh, the rest of the plants, we will see that we have included the scenario. And uh, still, this is not uh, come to the base case plan. So what we expect is normally, according to the the our demand predictions and the characteristic of these, uh, uh, whatever power plant we are using. So we use a 600 megawatt unit. Still, the unit size is very high. So therefore, the the demand should be high in order to match this uh, unit size. Maybe if you have the, 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 the reliable data with uh, what is the, the lowest capacity, how the ramping rates and the flexibilities, sometimes it may come earlier. So that is there. So I think this everything is uh, covered in the, uh, our professor's lecture. So that is not required. So that is the end of my presentation. I think it's uh, not the, the much on the nuclear power, but this is how we can accommodate in the power plant into the system. So that is, uh, you can see, and we can, uh, if you have any questions, we can discuss it later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vijay Kohn for sharing these ideas and thoughts with us. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Tushara Ratnayaka, senior lecturer from University of Moratua, to address the gathering and share her thoughts about the topic. Over to you,
Good evening to everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Chairman Dushanta, for inviting me today. So, before going to the challenges that we have to face when we introduce nuclear power into Sri Lanka, I would like to give a brief uh, introduction about the nuclear energy. But as uh, Professor Rosa also introduced some things, I think I can quickly go through that. So, we know that nuclear energy is the energy that is created inside nucleus. Okay, so, but uh, to useful or to get use of that energy, we have to harness that energy. So only in nuclear fission and nuclear fusion reactions, that energy is uh, given out. So in the sun and stars, the main uh, power source is the fusion energy. So in the fusion uh, reaction, mainly that uh, two lies, uh, that lighter isotopes or light materials combined and make a heavy isotope. In that process, huge amount of energy is released. That is because the mass difference between light isotopes and the heavy isotope is uh, different. That mass energy, that uh, difference of mass is converted into energy as to the Einstein equation. And because it multiplied by square of the light of velocity, that is a huge energy. So that is actually an inexhaustible source of energy, but still, uh, although the researchers are trying for a long duration, still it is a dream to the real world. And only nuclear fission is what we are currently using. So in the fission reaction, uh, heavy isotope is breaking into lighter isotopes with the activation of a neutron. And uh, in that process also, a huge amount of energy is released. Normally, as Professor Rosa also highlighted, when we compare with the chemical energy, that is million times higher energy. Uh, normally, uh, only three nuclear fissionable materials are existing in the world, uranium-235, uranium-233, and plutonium-239. So if we com consider the uranium-235 fission, if one atom make a fission reaction, that will release 200 mega AV energy. Therefore, that is a huge energy. And not only that, the products that are produced as a result of the fission reaction, those are heavily radioactive. Therefore, that is one of the things we have to consider because we have to carefully handle radioactive materials. And uh, in addition to that, neutrons are also produced. So we can maintain a chain reaction in the fission because the produced neutrons can initiate another fission reactions, but uh, by slowing down them, that is what we call the moderation. So if we uh, not control this chain reaction, that will that is end up with a disaster like nuclear weapon or nuclear bomb. Okay, so but in a nuclear power plant, we are uh, well control the chain reaction and we can maintain a constant power output. So if we get the history of the nuclear energy, that is, this is not uh, recent. Uh, after finding fission in 1938. The first uh, nuclear reactor was uh, established, that is first critical operation was went out in 1942 and first electricity generation happened in 1951. As you can see in that figure, the light bulbs have uh, lit using the nuclear energy. That is the first demonstration and uh, first commercial electricity has been produced using nuclear in 1957. And if we consider the current situation, uh, currently we have 440 nuclear power reactors in operation in 32 countries. Uh, majority is in USA, 93, France, 56, China, 55, and various other countries have a lot of uh, nuclear reactors. And uh, in the world, from the total electricity generation, 10% comes from the uh, nuclear, and uh, around 60 more reactors are under construction. And also some uh, about 30 countries are currently considering planning uh, or they have started nuclear power programs. And when we compare the low carbon power sources, nuclear is only second into the hydro. And uh, these are the reactors under construction. Uh, China is, uh, they have 20 new reactors are in, uh, under construction, India eight and various other countries are also having uh, some reactors in uh, construction stage. And uh, this will show the emerging countries that is uh, they have considered because they're not yet started, but they are with various agreements levels for the nuclear power, especially Russia and China is providing uh, technology and uh, capital, all the things. So you can see Sri Lanka is also <coughs> in the list because Sri Lanka has already started pre-feasibility studies. 
and uh, when we see the nuclear reactors we can identify there are different types of nuclear reactors so mainly uh, based on materials used and also based on different operating conditions we can classify nuclear reactors majority of nuclear reactors are uh, PWR, pressurized water reactors, boiling water reactors, those both are light water, that is coolant and moderator, both light water, normal water. So those are the majority operating reactors in the current situation, 301 reactors uh, in PWR and 42 BWR in operation today. And other majority type is heavy water reactor, can do reactor, that is the Canadian production. 46 reactors are in operation at the world today and various other types are available based on different materials because different moderating mediums and coolants are considered. And one of the imaging reactor type is small modular reactors. That is the current uh, trend in the world and most interesting in the world today. <coughs> I'm not going to detail, but uh, if we get uh, light water reactors, uh, you can see the operation of PWR and BWR. So, in the reactor vessel that has a nuclear uh, fissionable material and that produce heat using that heat the steam is produced and that is coupled with the electricity generation that is the basic principle uh, almost all same as the thermal power generation only difference is uh, instead of burning coal or other thermal fuel we are using heat generated in the fission reaction and uh, in uh, pressurized heavy water reactor, also the same technique, but the difference is not the uh, normal water. It use uh, heavy water as the coolant and the moderator. And if we see the uh, evolution of the nuclear, gen nuclear reactors, we can identify mainly <coughs> starting from generation one. Generation one is the uh, very early reactors that is the started period of the nuclear power. Currently they are not in operating. Uh, generation 2 reactors are currently uh, in the operation stage in the world that is started around 1970, various PWR, BWR and heavy water reactors. And uh, then generation 3, 3 plus and generation 4 reactors came. So that is uh, for generation 3 and 3 plus reactors are uh, with some modifications to the generation 2 reactors. That is by adding different advanced features, generation 2 reactors have been modified. And uh, some of generation three reactors are currently in the operating uh, mode in the world. And generation four reactors are totally innovative designs. That is a completely new uh, designs. Still they are in the research and development level and it should be expected to come after 2030. And uh, when uh, go for evolutionary and innovative reactors, various uh, advanced features are considered, especially the passive safety, because when we talk about nuclear safety is the most important thing. So <clears throat> passive safety means that uh, no need any human or power involvement to automatically working. So that is one of the main consideration in the innovative reactors. In addition to that, the designs advancements, modular design, and also economy-wise, it consider better economics and high standards, likewise, longer refueling cycles, that kind of things are considered. And these are some generation three and three plus reactors. All are very large reactors, more than 1000 megawatt, but uh, some of them are currently in operation stage in some countries. These are some generation four designs. So the main difference here is that instead of uh, light water or heavy water, they are considering different other coolants, especially because to increase the efficiency, because with the water, there is some limitations that we can go up, but uh, various other uh, liquid metals and gases have considered to increase the efficiency, but still they are in research level. And uh, if we come to the nuclear power in Sri Lankan context, Actually, first we have to think, actually we need nuclear power. I think because now we heard some uh, talks, uh, it is somewhat clear that uh, it is already installed in our generation expansion plan and also government has taken some initial decisions. Therefore, if we go for nuclear power, I think government should work firmly. That is one of the main requirement. And uh, we have to work uh, from right now because it is not a short program. Uh, if we start right now from this stage, I think it need more than 15, 20 years to complete a project. Therefore, we have to act uh, accordingly. 
And uh, if we consider the positive factors of nuclear, I am not going to detail because Professor Rosa also explained everything. This is a very clean energy source, no any greenhouse gas emissions, because currently world is uh, trying to change into uh, clean or no carbon emission world. This is one of the best option and very high technical uh, features and very advanced reactors have been introduced and inherently safe. And this is not intermittent source like solar wind. And when we compare, consider energy security and diversity for the Sri Lanka, we need some options because we know that uh, if the hydropower generation is low, we have to totally depend on thermal. And economic wise also, that is somewhat comparative. I will come in later and uh, but we have many challenges to overcome so these are some of the things as I identified mainly the public acceptance but I think if a government is taking a firm decision that can overcome uh, that is up to the government and uh, and also we should give uh, the correct information to the general people and uh, they should be uh, educate or informed as uh, soon as possible if we go for the nuclear power. I think that is a must requirement. And uh, another challenge is the high capital cost. So because uh, if we consider the economics of nuclear power, actually nuclear power is cost competitive only uh, except uh, the, for the countries that they have direct access for the low cost fossil fuels. That is if we get example, uh, USA, uh, Australia, China, they have their domestic coal reserves. Therefore, their coal generation cost is very low. But uh, until they not consider the environmental effects. But when we consider the environmental health social cost, then nuclear is uh, outstanding. And uh, also, uh, when we compare the uh, generating cost, the fuel cost for nuclear plant is very minor proportion because uh, it is uh, when compared with the other options, the fuel cost contribution is very low, but high capital cost is somewhat higher and it is higher than coal fired and also much higher than the gas fired power plants. But uh, when we uh, consider the levelized cost, uh, that is competitive. Okay, I will come uh, later and this uh, will show some studies done on uh, capital uh, cost of the various uh, energy options. Uh, if you see the nuclear, it is uh, roughly around 7,000, 6,000, 7,000 uh, US dollar per uh, megawatt hour. So, and uh, also you can see wind solar, those are uh, anyhow cheaper. But when we go to the coal power, that is also around 4,000. And if we consider the carbon capture option, uh, considering the environmental emissions, then it is somewhat similar to the nuclear power plant capital cost. And also some other technologies like fuel cells, those are same. And if you see the capacity factor on the last column, you can see nuclear, it is very high capacity factor, normally running more than 90% capacity factor. But the other intermittent sources like wind, solar, they have very low capacity factors. Therefore, considering all these factors and also the environmental cost, uh, if we calculate the levelized cost of energy, nuclear is very much competitive. In this uh, study, they have considered all uh, emissions and uh, other social factors, health, environmental, everything, and have done this uh, study. And according to that, you can see nuclear is very much cost competitive with the other options. And uh, levelized cost of uh, energy is uh, shown in this uh, table uh, that's, that has done by different uh, research people. So you can see for the nuclear in various studies, various factors. Actually, when we study, what we can see is that real cost factors are not available actually, because that also depends, especially that depend on discount rate and what is the place we are going to install. Likewise, there are various factors uh, affecting when we calculate the cost. So, but uh, based on these calculations in some of the studies that nuclear is somewhat very competitive with other options. And uh, another challenge is the, uh, if we go for very large reactors, that was the earlier uh, decision, 
that is a huge capital investment and because uh, we can only cover that if we possible to run the power plant for the total lifetime if in any accident or in any incident if we have to stop the power plant in the mid of the long lifetime that should be a huge capital loss into the country that is unbearable cost and uh, uh, also, there is a challenge to uh, connect to our small grid. And uh, therefore, uh, as Professor Rosa also highlighted, SMR is the emerging interest in the world today. And uh, that is uh, small power plants, more than less than 300 megawatt power plants. And they are inherently safe, economical, and uh, currently over 80 designs and concepts are globally uh, under the development. And... Uh, uh, some of the SMR designs are currently in the construction period and therefore in various uh, newcomer countries, this is the emerging uh, interest, not only for the electricity generation, but various other applications like uh, hydrogen production, water desalination, SMRs are considered throughout the world. And when we compare the size, you can see the SMR compared to a conventional reactor. <coughs> And uh, this is the current status of the SMR. Uh, there are various uh, land-based reactors. Uh, 31 designs uh, are worldwide in the production stage. And uh, marine-based reactors, that is, the total system is uh, built on a barge. And uh, that is one uh, marine-based reactor is currently operating in Russia and various other types as well. And uh, in addition to that, micro-reactors are also introduced. That is very small SMRs, less than 10 megawatt. So these are some of the designs has introduced into the world. And uh, these are marine-based SMRs. You can see the total structure has been built on a uh, barge and uh, that can transport or move from location to location. Uh, therefore, there are various options that uh, after end of the period, they can totally bring back the system into the vendor countries. So currently one floating reactor is in operation starting from 2020. This, uh, this is the one that is operating in Russia. So the whole system has been built on a, a barge. And this is 35 megawatt PWR type reactor and very high enriched fuel is used, 18.6% enriched fuel and refueling is three years. Normally the refueling is happened for the total fuel and not like the large reactors. And there are various other uh, applications as well for the SMRs as I already told. And uh, these are uh, some of the uh, operating and detailed design stage reactors of the SMR. And one of the main uh, problem we have to uh, careful is of the spent fuel and waste handling. But in this kind of uh, reactors, normally uh, they will be taken back all the uh, waste manage waste and all the spent fuel. They will be taken back to their countries after the operating period. Therefore, that is also one of the best option for countries like us. And if we compare SMR is conventional, uh, capital cost uh, is comparatively low because the size is smaller and uh, levelized co cost also comparatively lower and the construction period uh, because uh, for the large reactor, only for the construction, it takes more than five years. But for SMR, it is around one and a half years and longer refueling cycles. So some SMRs are available for 12 year working without refueling. Uh, therefore, when we compare uh, with the uh, conventional reactors, fuel requirement is low and spent nuclear fuel handling is easy and low risk in capital and very high safety. Therefore, this should be one of the best option for the countries like us. And uh, also I will quickly go through some other challenges. That is, if we go for a large plant, we have to think about the sites as well. Uh, this will show the uh, land requirement for different energy options. You can see nuclear is in the bottom. That is, uh, nuclear uses the least amount of land when compared with the other energy options. But that is for the construction. But we know that uh, we have to consider about emergency planning zones because in various countries introduce a different uh, criteria. This is one of the criteria that there is a five kilometer central zone 
that is the people in that area should be quickly evacuated if some accident happened. And middle zone is introduced as 20 kilometer and also outer zone has been introduced as 100 kilometer. Then all the safety precautions should be taken to evacuate people and get actions if an accident happened. And in addition to that, we have to consider about the safety because in the normal op operation, nuclear is inherently safe, no any radiation release, but only that can happen is the fuel meltdown. But uh, when in the new designs and new reactor uh, designs, various precautions are taken to minimize the probability of happening accident. And also another, that is the additional features have been added uh, to mitigate the effects of accidents as well. And when we consider the nuclear history, uh, currently over 19,000 reactor years we have completed in 36 countries. Only three uh, accidents have been reported. In those three also, the Three Mile Island accident was not released any amount of radioactive material or no any people died due to the accident. Only the Chernobyl accident was the disastrous one. Uh, people died and also considerable radioactivity was released to environment and in the Fukushima accident also no any people died due to the radiation release but only uh, some radiation components and it is like cesium released to the environment and only environmental damage and capital cost cap that is the capital loss that is the main things but in throughout the history that is the only reported accident. I just included this one to show you about other energy related accidents. This is just a part, uh, but uh, there are a lot of accidents in the energy sector. If you get one that is in 1975, you can see due to hydroelectric dam failure, um, around 230,000 people has died because we frequently heard in China like coal and gas explosion. There are a lot of accidents. Therefore, when compared with the other uh, energy sector related accidents, actually nuclear is inherently safe. And also we have to think about high level waste disposal, but that is also very small amount when compared with the other energy options. That is, for example, if we consider 1000 megawatt nuclear reactor, only uh, around three cubic meter of nuclear high level waste is generated in a year. Therefore, it is a small amount. But we have to carefully handle because highly radioactive. And there are some other risks like possibility of terrorist attacks and nuclear weapons proliferation. And also uranium is a scarce resource. Therefore, something like we have to think for other options like thorium. And uh, finally, uh, if I conclude, uh, nuclear is inherently safe with the new technologies, but it is a huge capital investment. And uh, but uh, in the uh, levelized cost that is competitive with other technologies and the uh, spent nuclear fuel handling is a challenge to country like us. Therefore, uh, something like small modular reactors, especially offshore built small modular reactors should be most uh, suitable for countries like us because no require any land and less capital cost, less risky, and also no worries about the spent nu nuclear fuel handling. Thank you, and I will come discussion later. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tushara Ratnayaka. I think she is one of very few uh, uh, academics currently available in Sri Lanka who has studied this uh, area and who is still researching. So it is a very valuable session for us. Now uh, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Saminda Jayasekara, the chairman of uh, Sri Lanka Atomic Energy Regulatory uh, Council. Uh, he will be uh, specifically describe about the legal aspect of this concept. And over to you, Ms. Amin. So only part of it.
thank you mrs shanta for inviting us for this uh, valuable session my i'm mainly focusing on the that the so legal and regulatory framework for enable the nuclear power program in sri lanka presently we are governing under the atomic energy act number 40 of uh, 2014 by this act we have uh, repealed the atomic energy authority act number 19 of 1969 by that uh, atomic energy authority act number 19 of uh, 1969 Uh, created atomic energy authority in sri lanka that atomic energy authority in sri lanka it was the both regulator and the promoter for radioactive or any radiation related matter but uh, thereafter in the, not only sri lanka that entire world there was a, say the trend created uh, especially in the atomic energy and the nuclear areas that the promoter and the regulator can't be the same institute Uh, thereafter that after many discussions and the so many things then the 19 2014 this uh, new act uh, created and thereafter that from uh, 1st of january 2015 two institutes uh, incorporated one was the sri lanka atomic energy regulatory council which i am representing as a regulator and the atomic energy board with uh, professor rosa and uh, mr malinda representing that's a promotional body and they are doing the researches and the services related to nuclear and uh, these areas then uh, this uh, act uh, uh, that uh, say for safety security and the safeguards uh, it's up to the international standard and we are we are uh, later discussing detail about the safety security safeguard and other aspects also which are required for nuclear then uh, the the one of the major thing in this act is this is only for non power nuclear applications it's very clearly mentioned it is uh, uh, that it created the powers to uh, that the regulator promote health industrial environment and agriculture sectors there is no provision for power in atomic energy act number 40 of 2014 it means say the sri lanka government or the parliament not given us either atomic energy board or atomic energy regulatory council to any any power to promote or do any act related to nuclear power then uh, basically it uh, that uh, mainly radioactive matters that uh, whatever that uh, we will discuss hmm? so basically for promoting and the protection of the individual society and environment and from the harmful effects of ionizing radiation then presently we we all know we don't have any nuclear power plants even though research reactors and isotope uh, production facilities we have uh, basically radiation applications in sri lanka like the, all we know medical applications we have in uh, all major hospitals that uh, teletherapy uh, and other other things and the industrial application we have a few places and and, uh, and uh, those are the things we are presently regulating and they are promoting then when we are going ahead with the nuclear power program these are four elements we are always talking that's uh, safety security safeguard and liability that we have to consider all these aspects related to these areas in our new uh, nuclear law sorry the technical yeah yeah uh, first thing is that we are talking about the nuclear safety what the look kara ah bhai dekh
Muhammad tried and then we go try nuclear safety rule refers to the set of regulations guidelines and standard that govern the safe operation of nuclear facilities and activities basically that uh, that main areas on the safety law that design construction operation and decommissioning of nuclear facility actually you all know even now that if it's a x-ray facility that we are we are involving in the first stage that the, when when building those facilities that how how the door comes that uh, and into into those aspects also we are looking in the in the in the law we have to especially design these aspect how to how to monitor these areas in in the nuclear safety and the handling and disposal of radioactive materials then the how we are go ahead with the emergency preparedness hmm? also how to respond in the event of the nuclear incident then here also that basically that we we are planning to prevent and mitigate any accidents uh, also that uh, Again, we are talking about the public how health and safety in the in these aspects. When uh, that uh, when we are talking about the nuclear law, we always go in ahead with the what what are the conventions we have to follow and we have to sign that the, say simply that if we are not signed with these conventions, that the either International Atomic Energy Agency or any vendor country are not coming to uh, that go ahead with our nuclear power program say that uh, in the con in conventions in the, on the safety areas convention on nuclear safety convention on early notification on nuclear accidents and the convention of uh, assistance in case of a nuclear accident or radiological emergency those are already signed by sri lanka that only thing that we have to sign joint convention on the safety of spent fuel management and on the safety of radioactive waste management we call joint convention that is not signed that we have to sign this convention before starting in nuclear facility as well as we have to provide provisions in our act saying that we are going to sign this thing and we are unable to sign these conventions then uh, other one is the nuclear safeguard uh, nuclear safeguard that's a, a special thing from other three areas because in uh, security uh, security um, nuclear security uh, nuclear liability and uh, nuclear safety that we we have to go ahead with international conventions but here that nuclear safeguards talking about the nuclear weapons and uh, to that prohibiting how to those things and international atomic energy agency especially signing with each and every country that's a uh, safeguard agreement first one is a safeguard agreement that basically that we are agreeing with the uh, international atomic energy agency we are not going for any nuclear weapons and we are using nuclear power only for peaceful purposes that the so tagline also of international atomic energy agencies atoms for peace then it's a then there's another agreement called additional protocols it came uh, recently in in that we are giving special powers to uh, international agency that uh, they can come to sri lanka they can uh, anytime they can check our facilities is there any vulnerable things happening and we have to give special visas to those people something like that say however in uh, in we have already entered into safeguard agreement with ia in 1980 However, in the additional protocol, still we haven't signed. We are these days we are negotiating with the IEA how to go ahead with uh, this one. Uh, that we believe that uh, before uh, that uh, going for nuclear power plant, we have to sign the additional protocol also. Uh, Cabinet of Ministers already grant the approval to Sri Lanka to go ahead with the additional protocol. Then the next one is nuclear security. Uh, basically, that in the nuclear safeguard we are talking about how we are going to protect our people how what are the measures we are taking to protect the people but here say that the some unplanned incident something like uh, theft uh, sabotage uh, unauthorized access or any malicious acting if something happening 
see how we are acting on those things and especially that we have to make provisions for preventing any uh, terrorism act or uh, any uh, uh, some 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 kind of uh, any any illegal matters related to nuclear things happening how we are going to protect these things and how we are going to protect the individuals uh, nature and the country from uh, those uh, uh, incidents uh, in that we have to uh, there are two um, two conventions we have to sign uh, with uh, with the iea that one one is that the convention on political protection on uh, nuclear materials and the, there's an amendment also came to the uh, um, convention on the physical protection of nuclear materials we haven't signed any of those things up to now if we are going for nuclear power we have to sign those things and earlier i mentioned we have to provide the provisions in some act also that we are we are ready to go ahead with these uh, conventions and the other thing is that the liability provisions basically liability means that it's a, a worldwide concept hmm? that if if a vendor is there that who's producing these things and the who owns the reactor is responsible for some nuclear accident because they say that we know that the, we are a not a, a rich country that we don't have uh, resources and we don't have funds to um, compensate people because of that mm, that there are liability conventions you have to come in to agree before going for nuclear program in in that context mm, uh, so there are a few conventions we have to agree and we have to go ahead with mm, then only that the vendor country is willing to come to Sri Lanka say there are four conventions uh, that we are, that the Vienna convention and the uh, conventions for supplementary compensation of nuclear damage. Those conventions, uh, Sri Lanka cabinet uh, already approved. Uh, say so how it happened was that the first uh, proposal came from uh, Russia to Sri Lanka, that before going with the open uh, bid process. Hmm? Then that if we are okay with these two conventions, Russia is willing to come to Sri Lanka. But however, that if we are going to others that say that that was a geopolitical thing, the Paris Convention covered all Western countries. You say that uh, UK, that whatever the Western Europe countries, uh, those are the members of Paris Convention. If we are not a part of the Paris Convention, then those countries are not coming to Sri Lanka. That because of that, if we are thinking of coming, uh, getting down those people, we have to sign the Paris Convention also. Then join protocol related to application. Then the, there's another thing came to join in both. Hmm? Both Vienna and the Paris, hmm? those two still we haven't signed. Actually, all four we haven't signed, but uh, this, these two, that the Vienna Convention and the Convention on Supplementary Compensation, we have already, that the cabinet has already given the approval. But along with our uh, cabinet paper, that we have to submit uh, these things also, we have to ratify. And now that we have the mandate from the government to go ahead with these uh, conventions. Basically, these regulatory requirements we have to include in the new law, uh, handling and the disposal of nuclear materials, safety requirements for nuclear facilities, security requirements, uh, liability provisions, then the regulation from A to Z, basically uh, siting, designing, operations, commissioning, and the till end of the decommissioning of the facility, those regulations we have to then the what are the international treaties and agreements related to the non non uh, proliferation and the licensing inspection and uh, those requirements for nuclear activities these things we have to include in the new new act then uh, say now uh, we have first identified we don't have provisions for nuclear facility now then uh, first thing we what did do was that the Say once uh, that Malinda and the team engaging in these these uh, process for more than ten years now, uh, on the invitation of uh, Atomic Energy Board, uh, that the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency conducted integrated nuclear infrastructure review. It was carried on uh, April 22 and uh, issued the report uh, in uh, 2022 
uh, to Professor Rosa, then they are they mention these 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 things that we have to adhere, we have to attend, we we have to go for these things. Among that, uh, they uh, very clearly mentioned uh, say what are the legal and regulatory framework that we have to modify you, and uh, then because of that, they have uh, uh, that as a suggestion they they conducted the gap analysis also. What is, uh, what is in the existing act that is there any new act coming? What are the things that we have to do? Then uh, we have that as a regulator, we have sent a letter to Justice Minister on uh, June last year to appointing a new committee to enact a new law, amend the new uh, amend the existing act. Then uh, Honorable uh, Justice Minister appointed the committee headed by Honorable Sobhita Rajaparna, Justice of the Court of Appeal, including uh, members from Attorney General Department, uh, Legal Draftman Department, uh, Foreign Ministry, Atomic Energy Board, Atomic Energy Regulatory Council, Ministry of uh, Power and Energy, uh, Electricity Board, and various other stakeholders to uh, in a, the, the, to get uh, uh, whatever the either either I mean the present new act or enact a new act. Hmm? Then, uh, but the committee new has decided to go ahead with the new act and the repeal the existing act. Hmm? And both uh, promoter and the regulator powers and objectives coming under one act hmm? because then the that we can uh, reduce or that we can minimize the overlapping of our other two institutes. Hmm? And uh, these days that we are on this process hmm? and uh, we are planning to uh, complete uh, the first draft uh, by April this year and uh, we are hoping to complete the entire uh, process by uh, September 2024 because of the, our target uh, we have uh, scheduled because of that we all know the presidential election coming from uh, September, October period. Whoever comes as the president, that the this next day will be the parliament will dissolve. That basically we wanted within this within this period, act and complete. Yeah. Basically, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, then we'll meet on the question and answers. Thank you very much, Mr. Saminda, for your valuable thoughts as from the legal aspect. Now we are going to hear from a key scientist of this area, Mr. Malinda Ranavira. He is one of a, a key person who is engaging in this area to develop uh, nuclear uh, power strategy in Sri Lanka. So without taking much time, I would like to invite Mr. Malinda Ranavira over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dushante, for inviting me to conduct the uh, presentation in terms of nuclear energy uh, potential in Sri Lanka and its challenges. Uh, uh, we uh, listened to four distinguished uh, speakers about uh, nuclear energy and uh, its uh, industrial side, the theoretical side, and uh, how is the current energy planning going on by uh, our utility, Pilon Electricity Board. So uh, first, uh, if we concentrate about the global situation of nuclear power, uh, currently uh, 413 uh, nuclear power reactors operating in within 31 countries. Uh, every five continents operate in nuclear power reactors in North America, Europe, uh, Asia, uh, Latin America, Africa, and Middle East. Uh, currently, uh, Turkey and uh, Turkey, Bangladesh, and Egypt. Uh, under constructing new de new, new uh, nuclear reactors uh, in Europe, uh, as all of you are aware, uh, in last year April 2023, they phased out all the nuclear reactors uh, due to political decision. 
but it is not a uh, technical decision because a lot of professionals against this uh, uh, some stupid decision <laughs> in by German government. But uh, the funny thing is behind the screen is that uh, Germany shut down all the nuclear reactors and they import electricity uh, through the European common grid, especially from France. I th uh, as all of you are aware, France is generating uh, electricity more than 70% uh, from nuclear sources. So uh, within the Asian continent, uh, China, Japan, South Korea, uh, they are uh, establishing uh, big nuclear power plants. And our big brother, India, also uh, established uh, new, uh, nuclear power plants. And Pakistan and Taiwan also operating nuclear power plants. So uh, according to the Power React Information System website uh, driven by International Atomic Energy Agency, 413 reactors operating within 31 countries. You can see that uh, 58 reactors are in under construction level. So uh, you can see that uh, 25 nuclear reactors are in suspended stage due to some technical errors, especially those suspended reactors are came from Japan after the Fukushima Daiichi incident. So uh, you can see that uh, in the Asian region, uh, Big, uh, big nuclear renaissance, you can see, especially in China, uh, more than 55 reactors are in uh, operational level, seven reactors, uh, eight reactors are in under construction level. South Korea operating 26, uh, two are in under construction. Japan uh, uh, operating uh, 32, 33 reactors and two are in under construction. India operating 19 reactors uh, and eight reactors are in under construction level. Pakistan is uh, six reactors. Uh, in operating level, uh, one is suspended. Uh, United Arab Emirates, three reactors are in operating level, one is in under construction. Iran, one reactor is uh, operating and one is in under construction level. According to the IAA milestone approach, uh, we can divide uh, the uh, embarking countries' status as phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one means considering, phase two means preparing, phase three means uh, constructing. According to the uh, IA milestone approach, 16 uh, countries are uh, considering embarking, but still not take a firm decision. Uh, 10 reactors already, uh, 10 countries already uh, take the post decision stage. Uh, those countries are like Bangladesh, Egypt, Ghana, so on and so forth. The Sri Lanka is in uh, decision making phase, but uh, luckily we have to inform you that as Professor Rosa informed in earlier. Uh, one week ago, Sri Lanka Cabinet of Ministers approved to go for the uh, nuclear as a strategic and knowledgeable decision on behalf of Sri Lanka. So, uh, according to the our geological uh, diversity, geological portion, Sri Lanka is located in Indian Ocean uh, beyond our territory, 204 kilometers away from Kalpitiya, Kudankulam in uh, near. Uh, India, uh, Kudankulam uh, nuclear power plant is established. Uh, two reactors, 1,000 megawatt reactor sign of operation level, four reactor sign under construction level. Uh, in uh, uh, near the Bay of Bengal, Bangladesh, they under constructing two reactors with the capacity of 1,200 megawatt. In Pakistan, Karachi, they operating uh, two reactors with the capacity of 1,100 megawatt uh, near Karachi. In Punjab and uh, Islamabad, they operating uh, four reactors with the capacity of 330 megawatt. So th that is the uh, brief situation of the Indian subcontinent. How is uh, uh, the nuclear uh, composition is going on for the power generation? So you can see that this is the under construction uh, site of the Ropur power plant. Uh, th that reactors you can see that uh, cooling. Uh, sorry. Uh, you can see that uh, cooling condensers are uh, there, and uh, this is the reactor pressure vessels. You can see that uh, river Ganga is flowing there. Uh, in addition, uh, construct a Russian Rosatom. They uh, built uh, artificial reservoir as a backup coolant uh, if uh, when uh, water is uh, not available in the drought season. So this is the latest picture of the Ropur power plant. So uh, currently, uh, entire world uh, is considering about uh, greenhouse gases emission and the sustainable development goals. Sri Lanka was uh, also aligned with the uh, to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2030 and net zero emission by 2040, 2050. 
in that context uh, many euro european union parliament take a policy decision to uh, uh, waive off the tax for the new nuclear establishment and new lng establishment in addition uh, germany is uh, currently rethinking to consider the nuclear power option because uh, many professionals forced uh, to german government to rethink about that uh, decision in addition uh, earlier uh, for ma major coal uh, based electricity generation countries like poland they uh, take a policy decision to uh, shut down all the coal power plant and convert it into the nuclear power reactors uh, in addition uh, nuclear neutral countries like estonia denmark norway they uh, launch huge uh, nuclear power programs uh, in uh, co collaboration of many nuclear power vendor countries in addition uh, one month ago sweden changed their legislation to establish more nuclear reactors because earlier legislation they can only establish uh, 10 nuclear power plants in within their territory but uh, they changed their legislation to establish more than 10 nuclear power plants in the country so uh, i earlier mentioned that uh, the convention on climate change uh, cop 21 paris agreement and those uh, conventions uh, we uh, most of the countries are aligned with the, those conventions and their clauses uh, all of the countries uh, i think more than 80% countries are aligned with to achieve the carbon neutrality and carbon net zero targets sri lanka also uh, already drafted uh, the national determined contribution and those things so in that context Uh, Sri Lanka uh, already conducted uh, many technical discussion with uh, well established nuclear power vendor countries companies professor rosa also earlier mentioned that uh, we conducted technical discussion with russian state owned atomic energy corporation rosatom electricity de france uh, the main electrical utility of france they generate more than 70% electricity from nuclear and uh, china national nuclear corporation and seaborg uh, technologies uh, the joint venture of denmark and south korea and altasep nuclear cooperation we conducted many technical discussion financial discussion and uh, their uh, proposals uh, as uh, virtual format as well as physical form so uh, uh, within uh, early this year uh, uh, the cop 28 summit was held in dubai uae so 22 countries uh, their leaders uh, put into the one uh, place and uh, gathering and uh, they signed a declaration called declaration to triple nuclear energy by 2050 so uh, that uh, french uh, president macron also attended to this event iaa uh, director general rafael mario grossi also attended this uh, conference so uh, 22 countries uh, signed this declaration to triple the nuclear energy with uh, comparison to the present situation but uh, the important thing is russia china india not sign this convention but they try to they also their agenda also align with to triple the nuclear energy that is the uh, current situation so in addition Uh, if we concentrate about how is uh, going on the construction sites of nuclear power stations uh, by various nuclear power vendor countries uh, so rosatom uh, currently uh, under constructing uh, nuclear power plants in nine countries uh, russia hungary belarus turkey egypt china india bangladesh like right electricity de france uh, french uh, nuclear uh, utility they under constructing nuclear reactors in france uk china and finland so westinghouse uh, is a earlier uh, giant in nuclear technology in usa but now is little bit uh, their movement is little bit slower uh, so they are con constructing reactors in us and china also korea electric power company uh, with negotiation of korea hydro and nuclear power they are constructing uh, reactors in republic of korea and united arab emirates and china also in involving constructing in china and pakistan china national nuclear corporation so khnp reactors are under construction in uae as all of you are aware that any abu dhabi they are constructing 1450 four reactors uh, in abu dhabi 
with uh, collaboration of United Arab Emirates uh, Nuclear Co Corporation. So how, why we should uh, consider but concentrate about the nuclear power option? Nuclear is a kind of a clean and green energy source, a carbon and a greenhouse gas emission free source, economically competitive. I cannot say that nuclear is the most least cost uh, because uh, nuclear has some cost in the capital uh, cost basis. Uh, and also in the fuel cycle, uh, we have to bear some upfront costs. Uh, so in addition, when we go for a nuclear, uh, most important thing is careful planning after the study in the areas of socio-economic, environmental, industrial, technical, and legal aspect. In addition, public acceptance and awareness programs are also very important because uh, the uh, we have to aware all the uh, sectors, uh, even fishermen, farmers, they also aware about the what are the cost benefits of the this uh, prestigious technology. So, uh, current situ according to the current context, Sri Lankan electricity demand is uh, normally increased uh, 5 to 6 percent, but it may be changed uh, as I understand about the lectures of Dr. Vijay Kho. So, uh, decarbonization of electricity is also in a very hot topic within uh, all the supply chain in the global scenario as well as the Sri Lankan situation. So, uh, diesel energy needs also uh, considering uh, the countries like Sri Lanka. So, nuclear power plants can be utilized except to the electricity generation. Diesel energy option also can be accommodated. In addition, uh, hydrogen production. For the hydrogen production, nuclear reactors can be utilized. Uh, with, uh, through the hydrogen production, we can utilize this option for the even for the ammonia production and fertilizer production. It is also one of the burning issues arising through the Sri Lankan situation. In addition, uh, currently many diesel power plants are aging. So diesel power plants are going out. So we have to replace uh, diesel power plants and coal power plants uh, by nuclear because the nuclear is a very good a dispatchable energy source. In addition, uh, small modular reactors, Dr. Tushar also mentioned, uh, small modular reactor uh, can be coupled with the uh, renewable energy sources like solar and wind. So that option also very flexible uh, in the future scenarios. So uh, if we concentrate about the macroeconomic uh, situation in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka needs uh, more than 400 uh, electricity for the ongoing Colombo Port City project. Uh, government uh, shown some uh, willingness to uh, restart about the uh, metropolitan light rail train system, it need 200 megawatt electricity. If we uh, convert our conventional train system into electrified train system, it need another 200 megawatt electricity. So uh, if uh, Sri Lanka is interconnected with Indi Indian HVDC line, it's also very positive sign for the nuclear power option because in OPIC, uh, time we can export electricity to India. So likewise, uh, there are many macroeconomic benefits if we go for a nuclear power option. Uh, if I uh, going through the quick glance throughout the uh, project uh, cycle, the new uh, Sri Lanka is actually considered a nuclear power option not only in 2010, Sri Lanka is considered a nuclear power option in, uh, since 1974. Uh, I think uh, Professor KKYW led that committee in 1974. At that time also, uh, Sri Lanka is considered nuclear power option. Then in 1980s also, Sri Lanka considered nuclear power option. But those options are failed due to uh, uh, less government commitment and uh, various economic instability security situation and those things. But uh, in 2010, we got the cabinet approval to conduct a pre-feasibility study uh, to consider nuclear power program in Sri Lanka. Then uh, in 2010, Honorable Minister to the Minister of Power and Energy uh, officially uh, notified the International Atomic Energy Agency to go for a, a seek possibilities of nuclear power in Sri Lanka. Then in 2011, uh, ministry appointed a steering committee and co-groups, but unfortunately, after two days, Fukushima uh, Daiichi nuclear accident happened. 
then all the uh, member state in IAEA change their strategies about nuclear. Sri Lanka also changed the strategy. So uh, we uh, hold the program until 2015. Then in 2015, again, uh, within the CB Lease Coast Long-Term Generation Plan, nuclear option uh, is uh, came into the scene and discussed uh, within the energy committees. And then uh, Minister and uh, Honorable Minister asked to uh, launch a technical cooperation program with International Atomic Energy Agency in 2016. Uh, and IAA also approved the technical cooperation project for Sri Lanka. Uh, Ceylon Electricity Board led that project uh, and uh, we uh, conducted national workshops with the participation of uh, nearly 37 IA experts. Then in 2019, uh, appointed a steering committee, project management unit and working groups uh, as a shadow nuclear energy program implementing organization. In, uh, to, uh, from 2019 to 2022 period, we drafted uh, working group reports, steering, uh, comprehensive reports, self evaluation reports. Then those reports are evaluated by International Atomic Energy Agency experts. Then they are given uh, uh, the recommendations uh, to uh, Sri Lanka Atomic Energy Board in September 2022. In uh, 2024, uh, January this year, we uh, drafted the uh, integrated work plan with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Six officials attended uh, for this integrated work plan meeting on behalf of Sri Lanka. So we drafted the uh, next uh, two to four year plan with the International Atomic Energy Agency. And then in uh, this month, uh, 12th uh, February, uh, Cabinet of Ministers meeting, Cabinet uh, already given the approval to uh, way forward the nuclear power program with uh, strategic and knowledgeable decision. So that is the uh, brief uh, progress within last uh, 14 years. So according to the IA milestone approach, as I mentioned earlier, there are three phases, three uh, milestones. We already completed the phase one stage and we already take the milestone and also, then we can way forward the activities uh, within the preparing stage. So we have to uh, complete the uh, proper site survey. We have to establish the proper nuclear regulatory framework. We have to establish the proper legal framework. Then we have to uh, establish the sound technical uh, capacity building development program. So uh, within the nuclear energy program implementing organization framework, we established this uh, three layers, uh, steering committee, project management unit, and nine working groups. Those nine working groups uh, uh, considered all the 19 issues. So uh, those nine working groups, uh, nearly uh, 30 professionals contributed to draft the uh, comprehensive report, self evaluation report and uh, uh, working group reports. So uh, basically uh, within the phase one stage, we all, all already completed all the activities. Uh, pre feasibility study, NAPO formation, uh, in emission report, uh, so on and so forth. But uh, still, we haven't uh, drafted the environmental impact assessment report. But uh, within uh, June, uh, early June, IAEA experts scheduled to come to Sri Lanka with uh, participation of relevant stakeholder institution. We uh, final uh, we plan to finalize the site survey and uh, seed mission report. Then we can. Uh, proceed this uh, EIA report as well. Uh, in terms of nuclear law and uh, regulatory framework, uh, we study all the gap analysis and uh, we can finalize the uh, suitable nuclear, comprehensive national nuclear law within end of this year. And other issues also we can finalize. And also we already uh, drafted the expression of interest uh, to calling suitable uh, proposals from uh, well-established nuclear power vendor countries. Uh, in, uh, in addition, we already finalized uh, uh, nuclear react assessment, uh, roadmap, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so we are uh, some part of the phase two activities also we finalize. So the, the, this is also another uh, uh, diagram according to the IA milestone approach. Uh, we initially uh, finalize uh, 
phase one activities, phase two activities also uh, some extent we finalize. So uh, we have to identify the owner, operator, and regulator for the few, uh, future nuclear power, uh, power installation. In that context, uh, Ceylon Electricity Board is the currently major ut uh, utility. They operating uh, major power plants in Sri Lanka. So, uh, but a nuclear power plant is not like a typical thermal power plant uh, like a coal power plant or LNG. Nucleus are different. So in that context, uh, atomic energy or nuclear scientists or nuclear engineers should be contributed to the operational pace. In that context, we have to form a new uh, utility or new owner or operator for the future nuclear installation. In addition, current uh, regulator, atomic energy regulatory council is still in the very grassroots level. So we have to strengthen this atomic energy regulation uh, with the supporting of Public Utilities Commission Central Environmental Authority, Attorney General's Department, and Legal Draftsman Department. So, because because the uh, we have to uh, get license for the siting, operator, and the uh, reactor. So, in that case, atomic energy regulator have to be strengthened. Uh, this is the one of the uh, seen uh, as I mentioned earlier in a mission we have conducted in 2022 with participation of 10 IE experts. Uh, and then later, uh, early uh, this year, we uh, drafted the, the integrated work plan uh, for next uh, two to four years with collaboration of IAEA. Six officials represented on behalf of Sri Lanka, representing uh, from the institution like Ministry of Power and Energy, Ceylon Electricity Board, Atomic Energy Board, Atomic Energy Regulatory Council, Attorney General's Department, and Central Environmental Authority. So, uh, according to the IA milestone approach, we uh, already uh, completed working group reports, comprehensive reports, self evaluation report. In a mission, phase one also completed in April 2022. Integrated work plan meeting also uh, uh, successfully uh, completed uh, in early, uh, in the latter part of January this year. And uh, submission of the cabinet memorandum also finalized and get already taken the strategic and knowledgeable decision. So uh, next step is to, uh, we can uh, uh, drop our reports and our recommendations to the Sri Lanka parliament and uh, take a firm decision with the supporting of cabinet of ministers and excellency president. So uh, according to the IEA 19 milestone, uh, IA 19 uh, issues, we moderately developed 14 issues. Five issues are still not developed, but we already studied the gaps, uh, how to develop these issues. As an example, nuclear safety, fuel cycle, radioactive waste, nuclear safeguard, procurement. Those five activities can be overcome, can be achieved after uh, signing a proper agreement with the well-established nuclear power vendor country or company. So uh, then we can uh, way forward our program in uh, well-established uh, technical sound men. So uh, as uh, Mr. Saminda Jayasekhar, uh, the chairman of Sri Lanka Atomic Energy Regulatory Council mentioned, uh, sound nuclear legal framework also mandatory requirement to way forward the pro uh, safe, seek, clean, reliable nuclear power program. In that context, uh, nuclear safety, nuclear security, nuclear safeguard have to be established in a uh, solid manner. Then uh, we have to ensure the nuclear liability for the people, uh, general public, radiation workers, and environment. Without establishing safety, security, safeguard, and liability, we cannot operate any nuclear power plant in any part of the world. That is the IAE theme. So uh, we have to accommodate those issues when we way forward our uh, program. So uh, I am not going to explain this uh, slide. Uh, Dr. Vijay Kong uh, clearly explained um, earlier. Government take a policy decision to uh, way forward the balanced energy mix with 70% renewable and 30% thermal combustion. So nuclear is uh, also aligned with this uh, combustion, but nuclear is a halfly renewable source. Nuclear also thermal source. So in that case, uh, future uh, energy mix 
can be accommodated nuclei in well placement. So I'm not going to explain this slide also. Dr. Vijay Kohn clearly explained. But I want to point out uh, one more thing. Nuclear is a dispatchable source. Cold is going to be out from the future scenarios. So, so uh, high intermittency sources like solar, wind, hydro, those are seasonal sources. Th th those are cannot be given firm uh, continuous power. So uh, parallel to the solar and wind, we have to install the battery capacity. So levelized cost automatically goes up. But nuclear, no need to establish uh, spinning reserves like battery sources. So nuclear is like a coal and LNG, but nuclear is a clean and green energy source. In that context, nuclear have a very good uh, uh, position to cater to the future energy mix in Sri Lankan context. So uh, this is also a slide taken from the CEB analysis. Uh, according to the CEB analysis, uh, if power pl plant factor going for the 0 0.8, 80 percent, uh, the level S cost going to be uh, to uh, 10, percent, 10 cents of US dollars. It means nearly 32 rupees of Sri Lankan rupees. So nucleus, uh, we can uh, firmly say that nucleus is uh, quite competitive uh, energy source. So we urge uh, from the Ceylon Electric Board Generation Planning Unit to insert uh, these four options in future scenarios, but they ask some sensitive data. But uh, we are uh, not pushing to given some sensitive data, but we given some data according to the IAA, Advanced React Information System. So uh, within the future simulations, please consider 300 to 400 option. 1,000 to 1,200 option if we interconnect with uh, India as HVDC. Or oh, SMR based, uh, land based option, no SMR floating option. If we simulate those four options within the future uh, simulations in the CB generation plan, we can get a better picture, uh, compare and contrast with the other source. So in addition, uh, uh, last year, Ministry of Environment adopted the carbon net zero map. In, it, the, in that uh, carbon net zero map already approved by the cabinet, it's also aligned with the carbon uh, net zero targets and uh, carbon net zero emission. So in that context, nuclear is identified as a viable option beyond 2035. According to their uh, map, uh, they suggested uh, 600 megawatt nuclear portion in 2031 to 35 range, uh, duration. And uh, around 2040, they suggested another 1,000 megawatt nuclear composition. This also a little bit uh, some uh, favorable uh, proposal. So uh, according to the citing uh, issues, we already identified four regions. Uh, as we know, in 2004, uh, Sri Lanka hit a nine magnitude tsunami. That issues also we consider several technical factors, social factors are considered uh, with supporting of relevant stakeholder or the institution. That context, we identify four regions. Uh, within uh, month of June, uh, six, uh, four experts uh, from IAA uh, scheduled to come to Sri Lanka and uh, analyze the sites as a site survey. And then they given the recommendation for uh, those uh, four regions. Uh, within one region, we plan to uh, identify eight to 10 uh, potential sites. Then uh, uh, those regions can be compared and contrast and identify the, what, are the, what is the best region for establishment of future nuclear installations. So these are some factors again from the Russian uh, proposal, 7%, uh, 5%, 9% discount rate. They uh, uh, given some uh, figures for as a levelized cost of electricity. Within the, those uh, prices, uh, nuclear given uh, very uh, cost effective, very competitive price for the uh, electricity generation, even in Sri Lankan context. Uh, you uh, you can see that nuclear power plant plant life is sixty percent, uh, not like uh, coal power or LNG plant, uh, like hydro power plant plant life is sixty years. Plant factor also very high, more than ninety percent. But uh, capital cost is very high, but GHG emission is significantly very low, even uh, so as similar to hydro power uh, option. So. Uh, uh, 
another negative factor for the nucleus construction duration is little bit high for the large reactors but smr uh, cons construction duration is very less uh, those uh, figures came from the india and bangladesh uh, the kudan kulam power plant uh, they given data for the 3% 7% and 10% discount rate you can see if you assume 10 7% discount rate is the ideal discount rate then uh, they serve the electricity for the 12, uh, nearly 12 rupees sri lankan rupees uh, the if uh, we assume dollar as uh, 300 rupees so bangladesh figure out uh, the unit cost from 15 to 21 rupees uh, that range uh, as all of you are aware where our average electricity cost is 45 rupees in current context so we can identify the what are the benefits because nuclear power reactor is plant life is 60 years uh, plant efficiency also very high but construction duration is high that's also uh, we have to carefully consider those are some figures uh, we gain from several uh, nuclear power vendor countries, Chinese, Russian, French, Korean, American, the, their construction period uh, is similar, but uh, capital cost is uh, vary according to the vendor. So small modular reactor, uh, the land requirement and uh, evacuation zone is very less. Even uh, within uh, 10 to 20 acres, uh, we can establish a small modular reactor. But if we go for the large reactor, Land requirement is a little bit high, but uh, other economic benefits are also we have to consider. So if we consider about the payback period, nuclear uh, gain some negative factors because, because the nuclear payback period is going, goes to beyond seven years, uh, but coal and LNG uh, range from two to uh, four years. So in a nuclear economics context, Payback period is a uh, little bit high in uh, electricity generation using nuclear power. So uh, if we can compare and contrast about the Ropur and Kudan Kulam nuclear power reactors, refueling duration is for the Indian reactors 12 months, but Bangladesh reactors is 18 months. So uh, without any uh, routine maintenance or shutdown, uh, uh, shut off, uh, Reactor can be continuously run until uh, one and a half years. So another thing is uh, HR development. Uh, nuclear uh, need the well-disciplined, uh, uh, technical sound staff, uh, not only knowledge, skill, or attitude. Uh, we have to build up the high competent staff in the areas of engineering, scientific, technical, sociological. In that context, uh, professional bodies like institution of engineers can be play a big role in future scenarios to uh, build quality uh, nuclear engineers, quality electrical engineers, electronic, mechanical, mechatronic, civil, so on and so forth. In addition, uh, quality scientists also need to establish a proper nuclear power plant in the areas of nuclear physics, radio chemistry, radio biology, etc. In addition, quality technician, quality welders, quality uh, non-destructive testing uh, technicians needs to uh, operate uh, safe seeker clean reliable nuclear power plant in addition in sociological aspect quality nuclear lawyers nuclear economies also needed for the fruit salad uh, we uh, have to add uh, major composition from the papaya or pineapple or those things but we have to add some extent of lime and pepper so uh, quality nuclear lawyers and nuclear economists also need to uh, run this uh, prestigious technology based uh, power plant. So, uh, in power planning, uh, within the, this stage, we not need uh, much staff. Nearly 20 to uh, 10 to 50 staff is uh, needed for the phase one, but from phase two, we have to uh, allocate uh, proper uh, HR uh, for the regulate and uh, for the technical support. Uh, it uh, uh, range from 150 plus staff need. So in the operational level, owner and operator, uh, the capacity goes to 600 to 1,200. So well uh, established job create after establishing this kind of power plant, not like fixing solar power plant or wind power plant. Uh, life quality goes up 
good job creation, uh, society also gain uh, big benefit. According to the IMF analysis, uh, for the nuclear power uh, plant, if we invested $1, it might buy for $4. So uh, that kind of economic benefits gain uh, from this prestigious technology. In addition, Sri Lanka plan to establish a nuclear power education and training center with collaboration of uh, selected nuclear power vendor country. Within that uh, premises, we plan to establish a nuclear power uh, simulator, research react tank, uh, those uh, instrumentation laboratory, then we can give them the perm solutions to uh, HR development and capacity building development. So this is the action plan and uh, I am not going to uh, explain one by one, but according to the action, action plan, we, all the actions we finalize according to the uh, our uh, pre-assume uh, uh, planning stage with collaboration for IAA, but uh, the, those things uh, strengthen the legal and regulatory framework, safety, security, safeguard activities, site selection activities, HR development activities, activities have to be way forward in next uh, five to six years. Then uh, nuclear dream is not a dream. We can uh, be converted into a reality with the proper planning and proper uh, management. So that is my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Malinder. I think uh, we have discussed this uh, topic for a long time now. So time has gone up. So we have a little bit time for the discussion as well. So I would like to invite our uh, panelists to the head table. Because we have like very little time, we can entertain uh, only a couple of questions from our uh, physical audience and the online audience as well. So I would like to invite uh, Professor Rosa, Dr. Vijay Gold, uh, Dr. Tushara, Mr. Saminder and Mr. Malinder uh, come to the front table and uh, we can take questions from the audience. I think we have very short time for this. Thank you. So my question is to Professor Rosa. So how far we are from this, uh, if we start today, how far we are from this uh, implementing nuclear energy? Uh, I think it depends on the, uh, uh, the vendor country and the, the selection of the power plant. So, uh, if you, uh, but the SMR technologies are only emerging. Of course, uh, some countries have already developed. So, but the ministries also wants us to uh, finish this work, but at least by 2030, 32. So, uh, I can't give you exact time frame, uh, but uh, we have been talking this for a long time period. I think uh, Malinda. I mentioned that uh, starting from 2010 and early, uh, but now we are on the right track. So uh, I can't give you an exact time period, but uh, we will try to uh, do it as soon as possible. But if you go for, uh, of course, uh, smaller ones, it won't take much time. Uh, but if you go for, I think, as, as uh, CB officials told us, uh, at the moment, we can't go for a 
big uh, capacity power plant unless uh, we have a, a HVDC connection with India. So SMRs actually uh, uh, we can do it within two to three, maybe four years. Uh, so if you go for floating ones also, also uh, the time frame will be less because the everything is built in some other country and uh, they have to bring it over here. So it's like a plug and key type. So uh, so that's my uh, answer to your question. But exactly time period, I can't uh, I can't give you any guarantee. So my question is for Dr. Vijaykot. So, sir, you mentioned uh, now the government is in a strict policy that, policy that we are going to use 70% renewable energy in the future. So, they are very strict on that and the public is also supporting that. So, uh, with renewable energy, as you mentioned, we come across the problem of the variations. So, is this uh, plant, say for example, we get a 300 meg kilo uh, uh, plant, will that plant be able to control this variation? Will it be, will you have the ability to control the variation with that plant, unlike a coal plant? Yeah. Uh, with the present technologies, I think uh, the, the quick ramping rate and then ramping up and ramping down rate. So that will not support actually the, the variations, even with the small one. So the only thing we can consider is as a base load power plant. So, but the issue with the base load power plants, uh, I think I don't, I don't think that this could be daily recycle that the recycle that we start stop daily basis. So that is also not possible. And also having I mean, nine hundred coal megawatt with twenty percent renewable energy, we find uh, extreme difficulty in the operation of the the low load conditions. So that restrictions are there. So therefore, what we have seen uh, towards the maybe when the uh, towards the about two thousand forty. So that is the the present context. So we have seen that uh, with the, the carbon neutrality, that when definitely we have to phase out the coals and then replace it with uh, some other power plant, then there is a room. And also it may be the technology is developing. So there is a situation that this is also considered as a, the, the flexible power plant. So in that situation, this will come uh, quickly. So that is there. So even in the smaller size, you can see that starting from 1,000 megawatt, 1,200 megawatt, and coming down to 600, 400, 200, even now about 180. So the 180 is a, is a very sizable plant, uh, which can uh, actually uh, basically, uh, even with the, we can take it out also with the, the present technology development, it will be there. So everything is, I think, developing, and the technology is coming. So therefore, uh, sometimes it, uh, the as per the present context, it will be, the far away, but it will come early. Yeah, but uh, with the say, seventy percent, still we have the nine hundred megawatt coal. So in that situation, we will see what is the economics whether the we are decommissioning base out in the coal with this nuclear. So that we have to we have to evaluate. So there may be chance. The general, like, what's the uh, feedback? Uh, how has the committee gone through a uh, like, uh, even like, uh, have you checked what the general public's opinion is about this? Like, like a poll or something, what they think. I mean, so because uh, in the future.
So the general public opinion in the power generation, the power plant construction, even the, the renewable energy, they are possible. So you can imagine then how it happened if it is we are going for the nuclear power plant. So I think that the very recent planting experience, I think the when they are going to the ship their office to Malabe. So you can see the even the office to coming from a Calder Beach to the Malabe, there was a big protest. So in that situation, I think again it is the public perception that a new place they consider as a very dangerous thing. So therefore we have to have a kind of a education program. So this is uh, ultra safe. They have only been damaged and there are so many mitigated measures. And like that, uh, the public uh, education, the, the making this uh, very safe technology for power generation, and then there have not been any disruptions. Like uh, if you consider the, the accidents, only three have been there uh, compared with other accidents. So like that, uh, they, altogether, when, this, when we are deciding, when we have decided that we are going with the nuclear, then that is also we have to, the other part is we have to educate the people and then make the people aware and then it is acceptable to them. Yeah, I think that's a very good uh, question actually. Uh, now I think the young generation feel it differently, but uh, as you know, uh, I have come across some lot of people uh, who are advocating uh, solar power they are very much against uh, uh, nuclear. Uh, and uh, rest of the young people actually, uh, uh, I think they know the technology. So uh, as you said, it's uh, public uh, people always, when they say nuclear, uh, they have a fear. Now, even, you know, in, in medicine, uh, now that's why they have changed the NMR to MRI. Uh, so actually the, the technique is nuclear magnetic resonance but they changed to magnetic resonance imaging. So uh, that's why actually we had to educate the public. Um, of course, as he said, uh, uh, before 2015, uh, I think our old uh, building got demolished uh, because of the new Calni Bridge and then moved to uh, Malawi. But of course, there are a lot of political background also into that. Uh, so people also, we have to educate the people. We have to give the correct facts. As I said, there are, of course, nobody can guarantee um, any accidents won't happen. But uh, always SMRs and smaller ones, they say they are inherently safe. But inherently safe, that just mean is zero accident. So always in life, uh, even if you cross the road, uh, I might get killed uh, hitting a vehicle. So, uh, so those are the two areas that we have to uh, educate the public because when they hear about the nuclear, they, that uh, resonates a uh, different version. So uh, we have to tell that it's not a nuclear bomb. It won't explode like that. Uh, of course, uh, things have happened uh, because now even Fukushima, what has happened is the tsunami water came over the wall and then they had problems with the cooling systems, nothing with the core. So uh, the small modular reactors as... Uh, uh, the doctor also said, actually, there are a lot of passive controls. There are a lot of safety measures. So, uh, so that that uh, we have to educate the public. Your nice presentations. I am very clear about uh, you know, the fear what I had when out. And I'm clear now the technology, we have to move with the technology. This is the example now the AI era has come and uh, now we have to move what, move with the technology, uh, not what our people think. Our people, okay, the public domain, okay, we have to respect the public domain, but as our intelligent, I mean like as academics or whatever, that uh, so we have to think about, you know, what's the, the decision making is the, Thing that it's critical here, I, I think. So uh, my question is, you know, uh, with uh, what Doctor Tushar, as Doctor Tushar told that okay, it's clear this technology is exist. This technology, so we have to move with this this technology. Uh, I mean, like high chance, high probable. Uh, but uh, I think the problem is here that what exact product we are going to implement here this example china 
old, old days that people say Chinese products are, you know, very bad. But now we know uh, the best Apple phones also made from China. But, you know, so exactly how do we decide? I'm very less knowledge about this this area. So are we going to Russia? Or are, you, are you collaborating with uh, uh, France? So, so I think that's the key point that which country we are going to collaborate. So how, how as knowledge experts, so how do you take that decision? How, which country you are? So I think that's the critical point, you know, what product we are bringing here. And, and the second stage is the, you know, training of people. And uh, that's the secondary part, make the professionals to meet that standard. So is it not the critical point that, you know, are we going with Russia or are we going with what company? So how we come to that decision? Thanks. Uh, I think a very good question uh, that they have to be decided uh, by the government uh, because uh, most of the selection of nuclear power vendor is uh, some, uh, some extent technical aligned, some extent political aligned. Because uh, political agenda also very uh, uh, aligned with this uh, selection of uh, suitable nuclear power vendor. In addition, we have to select about how they given the proposal for nuclear power poor cycle. Because uh, we have to sign a 10 year, uh, 15 years agreement with uh, continuous nuclear power supply with that uh, uh, specific nuclear power vendor. In addition, uh, we have to take the proposal from them to how they given the solutions for uh, uh, back end of the nuclear power cycle. Some uh, countries uh, agreed to given solutions for spent pool and radioactive waste management. So we have to carefully think about those issues. And some nuclear power vendor countries given continuous education and training for the profession, engineers, scientists, and those people. So we have to think carefully think about those things. Some nuclear power vendors given assistance to site selection, uh, environmental monitoring, emergency response, and preparedness activities, uh, so on and so forth. We have to carefully think about those things. And uh, reactor types. All the nuclear power vendor countries uh, not produce uh, small uh, reactors, even generation three plus reactors. So we have to think about these things. So it depends on the our requirement, our political agenda, our technical requirement, and our necessity, education and training activities, and our location of the our countries are located in very strategic point of the Indian Ocean. So we know who are the friends, who are the uh, not make not favorable for our activities. So we have to think those issues, not only technical decision, but also socio-economic, environmental, everything we have to consider in a uh, very uh, considered manner. Up, up to now, we already finalized the react assessment based on the, those five proposals. So we know who are the peer, but we cannot publicly say it aligns with the uh, government decision, foreign ministry perspective. Foreign ministry also can play a big role because they deal with the international arena. So they have a big role. So Minister of Power and Energy, Cabinet of Ministers, Parliament, they have to think about. And professional forum like ISLO, SLASO, that can be uh, given huge post to the uh, upper people as well as the general public. They can convince, they can give them the better news, better message for the both people. So that decision, uh, we have to be careful thinking, we have to be careful take. Uh, in adding to what uh, Malinda said, that basically that when we are starting the process for that enact new law, that we also thought about that where to go, how to go. And then the we finally basically we decided hmm, with open mind that we are enacting this law. So that in the we discussed that when the liability that we are talking about, we have already the cabinet has given the approval for two conventions, which that the Western countries can't go. See, but that, so that we, we have decided to go with everyone. Then the then the when the time comes to select a vendor. Then maybe the France, maybe the Russia, maybe China or America, wherever that we can go. Then at that time that we can select, 
what is the best and that's it's and the, that the, we have to consider the geopolitical situation and the, those things also matters but for the present situation we are with open mind that we are working on the process hmm? that we are making the way to enable each and every person to come and the, make a fair field to everyone I think it has to depend on the financing also now. As far as we know, I mean, we have, our country has no money to invest. So, <laughs> that's the bottom line now. So, we have to think of now, uh, I mean, I am not for Russia, no, anything like that. But Russia has given us a very complete proposal uh, because they even, uh, they are ready to take our children, our uh, graduates and train them in universities and give in scholarships and, you know, but it's all geopolitical, no? I mean, you know, Russia also want hand in, as I told you, it's like the poultry corner. They want the India and India, the southern part of India, they are constructing Bangladesh and they want us also. Uh, so it all depends. But if you go with China, of course, India may not like it. Uh, so these are the things that we have to think of. And then how the, what is the best proposal, financial proposals that they give us? Because... Now, even uh, when we studied the Russian proposal on uh, the Bangladesh, actually, they are 15 years or 10 years grace period. And they are paying it with uh, using garments uh, back into the uh, Russian. So, uh, uh, now we have, I mean, we can't, in, we can't take loans, actually, because we are already in the trap. <laughs> so, uh, so, we have to think of, uh, as I said, personally, I like this uh, option option because it's uh, only power purchasing. So we had to agree on a certain rate, say 30 rupees or 20 or 6 rupees or whatever, that's it. Uh, so most of the countries, when, when we talk, they say uh, even with the power purchasing, uh, it won't be cheap as hydropower, of course, but it will be less than coal. So, I mean, so so that way, of course, you can minimize all these risks. And other thing is, if you use a barge, you have no waste problem because they will take it back. Now, some barges, actually, you can use it for 10 years without refueling. So, uh, so that's, that's my personal feeling is to start with, go for a op show. And later on, of course, as the time goes on, then we can even educate the public. See, now, because if the some barges, actually, nobody will protest, I think. Uh, so, uh, so, those are the things that we have to think of. That's why we are calling for EOIs. So, uh, once you call the EOIs, the, the vendor countries can send their proposals, and then we have to sit and carefully study. Thank you. So, thank you all for your questions. Hope there are no more questions, and now we come to the end of today's session. So, before we wind up, I would like to invite uh, Chairman, Electrical, Electronic and Telecommunication Sectional Committee, uh, Engineer Dushant Vanyarachi, and uh, CEO ISL, Engineer Neil Abhisekara, to, to hand over the token of appreciation to the esteemed uh, our panel members. So first I would like to invite uh, Professor SRD Rosa Chairman, Sri Lanka Atomic Energy Board. Thank you, sir. So next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Vijay Konbanda, the DGM, Transport and Generation Planning, Ceylon Electricity Board. Thank you, sir. So now I would like to invite Dr. Tushara Ratnayak, Senior Lecturer, Department of Electrical Engineering, University of Baratul. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. 
thank you engineer nilabe sekara for your time and now i uh, cordially invite uh, dr susant pereira to hand over the token of appreciation So I would like to invite Mr. Saminder Jayasekar, the Chairman, Sri Lanka Atomic Energy Regulatory Council. Thank you, sir. So now I would like to invite Dr. Mr. Malinda Ranavira, Scientific Officer, Sri Lanka Atomic Energy Board. Thank you, Dr. Sohoji. So, uh, thank you all for your valuable time. And now I cordially invite uh, Secretary, Electrical, Electronic and Telecommunication Sectional Committee, Engineer Vaini Saranga, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Uh, distinguished panel members, esteemed guests, colleagues, and participants. On behalf of the Electrical, Electronic, and Telecommunication Sectional Committee, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for your invaluable contributions to, to today's insightful panel discussion on the potential of nuclear energy and its challenges in Sri Lanka. Firstly, I would like to express our, my sincere appreciation to our esteemed panel members whose expertise and dedication have enriched our understanding of this crucial topic. Professor S. R. D. Rosa, Dr. Vijay Korn Banda, Dr. Tushara Ratnayaka, Mr. Saminda Jayasekar and Mr. Malinda Ranavira. Thank you, dear sirs and ma'am, for your valuable time and your presence here. Uh, and also, I would like to extend uh, uh, my gratitude to uh, EET Sectional Committee and all the Council members of IESL for their continuous support in organizing this event. Uh, Mr. Neil Abesekara, CEO of IESL, and all the dedicated staff members of IESL, your support and collaboration have been instrumental in making this event a success. Last but not least, I extend my sincere thanks to all participants who have actively engaged in today's discussion, sharing their insights and perspectives on this important topic. As we conclu conclude this panel discussion, let us carry forward the knowledge and insights gain gained today towards shaping a sustainable and resilient energy future for our nation. Thank you once again to everyone for your valuable contributions and unwavering commitment to advancing the engineering profession in Sri Lanka. Have a good night.